My name is Owen Harper, and a few months ago, I took a trip with my two best friends, Travis Willis and Kira Bolton. We'd all grown up together in a small town called Krausenvale in Oregon, and we'd always bonded over our love for exploring the hidden corners of the vast forests that surrounded it. We decided to spend a weekend hiking and camping in a remote location within the region of Mount Hood. On our first day, we started on the grueling trek to our designated camping spot. The conversation between the three of us was lighthearted and filled with laughter. We often teased each other for our lack of preparedness or difficulty navigating the terrain. We had become so relaxed that we didn't notice how late it had become. After setting up camp, we gathered around the fire to roast marshmallows and exchange stories. As evening turned into night, we heard a twig snap not too far from our campsite, followed by rustling leaves. All three of us froze. What was that? I asked, swallowing hard as the atmosphere around us changed. Probably just a deer or something, Travis said casually, but I could tell he was putting up a front for Kira's sake. We tried to forget about it and go back to our stories, but every now and then one of us would glance into the darkness surrounding us. The rest of the night was spent listening intently to any distant noises before tents were erected under false pretenses of fatigue. As daylight broke through the branches above us, we continued our hike deeper into the forest. After hours of hiking and spotting deer tracks and fallen trees on the path, we came across something neither of us had seen before, an abandoned cabin. It must have belonged to some wild recluse who wanted to be as far away from civilization as possible. Intrigued by this discovery, we couldn't help but venture inside. The cabin had a worn and weathered appearance, and a musty smell filled the air. The place seemed to have been abandoned for years, with cobwebs hanging precariously from the rafters. Then we found something strange a notebook covered in thick layers of dust on one of the tables. I carefully wiped off the cover and opened it to reveal pages filled with illegible handwriting and seemingly random drawings. Kira leaned in closer to get a better look. Chaveo, she said, reading aloud one of the few words that were clearly written on a page full of frantic scribbling. What's that? Travis asked, his eyebrows furrowing. It's some kind of creature from Native American folklore, Kiara explained. It's said to be a malevolent spirit that feeds on the flesh of humans who dare to enter its territory. Jesus, that sounds terrifying, I muttered, feeling a shiver run down my spine. We decided to leave the cabin as quickly as possible, as the eerie chill it had sent through all three of us lingered hauntingly. It was already dusk outside, so we agreed to head back to our campsite. However, we couldn't shake off the feeling of having disturbed something malignant. That night, we were again huddled around our fire when suddenly Travis went completely silent. His face went slack with pure terror as he stared into the dark forest behind us. Kira and I turned around, our hearts pounding in our ears. In the dim light from our flickering fire, we saw it, Chevelle. Its grotesque form loomed over us. The creature stood at least eight feet tall, its body a twisted mass of sinew with unnatural angles. Its eyes burned with a deep, malevolent glow that pierced through the darkness like two haunting stars. We couldn't move a muscle, paralyzed by the sheer terror that gripped our hearts. As Shiveo took a menacing step towards us, snapping branches underfoot, I somehow managed to break out of my trance and shout, Run! Without waiting for a reply from my friends, I bolted away from the fire and into the oppressive darkness of the forest. I could hear Travis and Kira's footsteps pounding behind me as we scrambled blindly through the underbrush. The roar of Shiveo echoed through the trees, 
threatening to devour us whole as it pursued us relentlessly. We didn't dare to look back or slow down for fear that one false move would seal our fate. Eventually, we stumbled upon a rocky ravine with a narrow river at its base. With no other choice but to jump or be captured by Shaveo, we made the leap of faith across the ravine just before the monstrous creature arrived at its edge. As we caught our breath on the other side of the ravine, we saw Shaveo screech in frustrated fury as it was unable to cross over. We continued to watch in horror as it paced the opposite bank before finally disappearing into the shadows once more. The three of us promised never to set foot in that part of Mount Hood again, and when we returned home, we did everything we could to erase any trace or reminder of Shaveo's existence from our lives. But deep within each of us, every now and then we find ourselves casting wary glances into dark shadows, fearing that someday this malevolent beast might come after us once more. So there I was, grabbing a bite at this old school roadside diner, when Ronnie Tanner walked in. We used to go to high school together back in the day, but man, time hadn't been kind to Ronnie. He was still sporting that signature devilish grin, but he'd put on some weight, and his eyes had a weariness that my own mirrored. We never kept in touch after graduation, but Ronnie now worked as a detective for the local police department in Carterville, Missouri, a small town near the Mississippi River. Sitting down at the counter next to me, he recognized me instantly and gave me an update on his life. I'd spent years traveling as a freelance journalist before I decided to come back home. Through slurps of coffee and bites of soggy fries, Ronnie told me about one particular case that scared the community half to death. An elderly woman named Edith Hammond mysteriously vanished from her home without a trace. Honestly, you could tell it rattled him quite a bit. As he delved deeper into the details of his search for Edith, his presumptions about what happened, the sense of dread I felt grew exponentially. It was only when Ronnie accidentally slipped, the drowner, into our conversation that my mind went wild with possibilities. The drowner? I asked involuntarily, my curiosity piqued. Ronnie paused for a second, then leaned closer and explained in hushed tones that he didn't really believe in folklore creatures or urban legends. But recently there had been more disappearances and even some gruesome deaths by drowning near Adair Lake, something the locals knew distinctly as the work of the drowner, a creature whose sole purpose was to hunt down prey and drown them in the murky lake waters. For Ronnie's rational detective senses, Alarm bells were going off because there was never enough evidence or clues linking these deaths or disappearances together, except for the fact that each victim was found near a body of water. We went through all those horrific incidents that day, and Ronnie was looking more stressed with each recount. Miles Gardner, a teenager found clutching onto the lakeside railing with his face submerged, and Kara James whose body surfaced five days after she disappeared, were bloated and starting to decompose. It wasn't until he told me about Mark Preston, whose body was dragged out of a dare lake in the most brutal state, that I realized our seemingly insignificant hometown harbored something much more sinister than we'd ever imagined. Before leaving the diner, Ronnie asked for my help as an investigative journalist. He knew I had connections and sources that he didn't. He just needed assistance to prove that this horrendous chain was no coincidence or myth. So, one week later, when he finally texted me some information about a possible suspect he'd discovered, a man whose name remained unknown, I couldn't say no. This anonymous figure was seen lurking around the places of disappearance on multiple occasions. When I went through my contacts and met with witnesses, people seemed hesitant and even petrified to talk. 
However, one brave woman agreed to share her story. She'd had a terrifying encounter with the mysterious man, who gave off an unsettling vibe. He had unnaturally blue eyes and wore dark clothes that matched his slicked back black hair, a resemblance too eerie to ignore. As we dug deeper into this dangerous world of forgotten legends and hidden monsters, Ronnie quickly put our findings together while we connected the dots of each case, always tracing back to this enigmatic character. Soon, we found ourselves at the edge of Adair Lake, the sun setting ominously in the distance and casting an eerie glow on the murky water. As darkness enveloped the area, we felt an unshakable sense of dread settle over us. We had decided to stake out the lake that night in hopes of uncovering more about the mysterious man and his connection to the drownings. Armed with my camera and Ronnie's keen detective instinct, we waited in silence, our ears attuned to any sound that would betray our suspect's presence. Hours passed, and our patience began wearing thin as fatigue tried to derail our focus. Just as we were about to pack up for the night, an unnatural chill coursed through the air. Suddenly, we heard faint splashing noises coming from a secluded part of the lake. My heart hammering in my chest, I readied my camera while Ronnie cautiously approached the source of the sound. The hairs on the back of my neck stood on end when we finally laid eyes on him, the enigmatic figure with strikingly blue eyes and a sinister aura. Before we could confront him, he slipped into the dark waters without uttering a word, disappearing into their murky depths as though they were his natural habitat. Frantically processing this absurd encounter, Ronnie and I exchanged glances of disbelief and horror, unable to comprehend what we just witnessed. As stories whispered by locals morphed into terrifying realities, we knew our investigation had only just begun. We were left with far more questions than answers as we started piecing together scattered information about this twisted man, who now seemed more myth than human. And with every clue uncovered, every passing day, our resolve grew stronger. We would not let him continue terrorizing Carterville any longer. It was my second year working as a paramedic in Tillamook County, Oregon, and I'd gotten the hang of dealing with all sorts of incidents by now. My name is Quentin Chambers, and before moving to Oregon, I had lived my entire life in New Jersey. My partner on the job was Jake Nevison, a seasoned paramedic who'd seen it all. Tillamook County was mostly quiet with its fair share of accidents and medical emergencies. Typical stuff. That was until one seemingly innocent call shattered our sense of security. Hey, Quentin, we've got a call, Jake said as he popped in from the ambulance door. A group of hikers found someone unconscious near Saddle Mountain. They say there's blood everywhere. I quickly gathered my gear and hopped into the ambulance. We were off blaring sirens cutting through the serenity of the wooded landscape en route. Arriving at the scene, we found the hikers clustered around a man lying on his back on the trail. His clothes were torn, and he was battered and bloody. Hey! What happened here? I asked urgently as Jake and I approached the group. One of the hikers spoke up. We don't know! We were hiking when we found him like this. Jake immediately began examining his injuries while I talked with the other hikers to gather more information. They seemed nervous but offered no additional insight into the situation. As we prepared to transport him to our ambulance, I noticed a crudely carved symbol on a nearby tree trunk. It looked vaguely familiar, but there was nothing I could put my finger on. We got our patient to the nearest hospital as fast as possible. It took nearly an hour to get there. The entire ride, our patient remained unconscious, with Jake constantly monitoring his vitals. 
After handing him over to hospital staff, we had some downtime and had lunch in town. I finally voiced what had been bothering me. Jake, have you ever seen anything like that before? Jake's forehead creased in thought. You mean the symbol by the trail? No. It's bizarre, isn't it? Kind of scary, I added. Days passed, and incidents involving brutalized people occurring near deep woods trails became common knowledge. Whispers circulated through the local diners and gas stations that it was the work of a mysterious cult whose roots went back decades in the area. The authorities launched investigations, with federal agents arriving to help. However, they kept things tightly sealed, leaving the community open to rumors and speculation. Six weeks after we'd found that first victim, Jake and I were called to yet another scene with a similar situation, a bloodied person on a remote trail. This time, it was a woman who appeared to have been violated horrifically. Her wrists and ankles bore deep ligature marks. Once recovered enough to speak, she revealed that she'd been abducted by numerous masked individuals who drugged her and dragged her in chains for days through the forest. They seemed to worship a dark entity and follow twisted rituals. News of her account spread like wildfire through town. People now knew that this cult's intentions were more sinister than we had thought. At least now they could grasp the gravity of it all. Then abruptly, the incident ceased. Months went by without any new reports or fresh leads, until that one fateful night when Jake and I were on our usual night shift. We were idly chatting over coffee when a distress call came in. Someone had dialed 911 from an abandoned cabin deep inside the woods. The caller's frantic and almost incomprehensible voice mentioned people in masks and voices chanting, a chilling echo of the stories we'd been hearing about the cult. This time, though, something was different. A handful of the bravest locals had decided to band together and confront the terror head-on by organizing late-night patrols to watch for suspicious activity. And they had just stumbled upon a group of hooded figures performing rituals in the cabin. Jake and I knew we couldn't wait for backup due to the urgency of the situation. With our adrenaline racing and determination to finally put an end to these horrendous acts, we ventured towards the cabin. Upon reaching the cabin, we saw, from afar, shadowy figures barely illuminated by candlelight inside. Cautiously entering, we could hear their otherworldly chants fill the dark air around us. There was something primal, cult-like, and malevolent about their voices that sent shivers down my spine. It was now up to Jake, me, and a group of brave vigilante locals to uncover the truth behind this terrifying cult once and for all, not only for justice but also for our own peace of mind, knowing that we could soon return to living in peace in our beloved Tillamook County. So there I was, sipping on my coffee and shooting the breeze with a fellow trucker named Carl at the Lazy J truck stop near El Paso, Texas. We usually find ourselves here every couple of weeks since our routes tend to overlap around this area. I'm Sam Caldwell, by the way, and I've been driving an 18-wheeler across the United States for the past 15 years. It wasn't always the most exciting gig but it paid my bills and gave me a decent lifestyle. That day started off like any other, just two buddies talking about life and sharing stories from our time on the open road. Little did we know what kind of madness awaited us. A young couple pulled into the gas station in their rusted, banged-up sedan. They looked road-weary as they stumbled out of their car and headed inside to pay for their gas. Carl and I didn't pay much attention until a loud argument erupted from inside. Bullshit, bellowed a voice. It was the guy from the couple, sounding pissed about something. The cashier kept calm but insisted that they had to pay cash for their gas, 
apparently, their card had been declined. The girl tried reasoning with her guy, but he stormed out angrily without even acknowledging her. When she caught up with him at their car, he yanked open the trunk and retrieved a crowbar. What are you doing? She shrieked nervously as he began approaching another vehicle getting filled up at a nearby pump. Before we knew it, this guy smashed the driver's side window of that car and started attacking its owner, a middle-aged woman who was now screaming for help. Carl didn't hesitate. He bolted towards them, trying to intervene, but sure as hell didn't expect what would come next. The enraged guy turned his attention towards Carl and swung his crowbar at him with astonishing speed and precision. Carl fell to the ground, clutching his bleeding head. I couldn't let this go on any longer, so I ran over to help my friend. The girl tried pulling the guy away, but he flung her aside and turned to me with an angry grimace. We exchanged blows, but somehow I managed to wrestle the crowbar away from him and knock him out with a blow to the temple. With quick thinking, I used my belt to tie his hands together, hoping it would buy us some time before the cops got there. The whole scene was pure chaos, with people staring in shock and disbelief at what had just transpired. As Carl recovered, we came to learn that the young guy was Vincent Keller, a delusional man who they suspected killed three people over a short span of time during frantic episodes fueled by drugs and paranoia. Apparently, law enforcement couldn't pin anything on him because they never had concrete evidence linking him to those crimes. It occurred to me later that if it hadn't been for Vincent's explosive reaction and almost getting both me and Carl killed, he might have slipped back into obscurity and continued his murdering spree until someone else happened to cross his path in the wrong place at the wrong time. Instead, as I stood there amidst chaos, gasping for air moments after what just went down at a run-of-the-mill gas station stop near El Paso, Texas, Fate had other plans for Vincent Keller. The aftermath of that day left a profound impact not only on my life but also on Carl's and the others involved. After carrying that weight around for some time, Carl and I decided to use our experience as a catalyst for change. We began spreading awareness about the dangers of drug abuse and mental health issues among truckers and travelers alike during our stops at various truck stations. We learned that our voices had the power to impact others, so we started organizing workshops and support groups in collaboration with local communities along our routes. We never thought that our lives as ordinary truck drivers could take such a meaningful turn, but there was no denying that we were making a difference in people's lives. As the years went by, our small initiative continued to grow inspiring others within the trucking community to join in and offer their support. Reflecting on that fateful day near El Paso, I couldn't shake the notion that everything happened for a reason. Sure, it was a harrowing experience, nearly losing my dear friend and witnessing firsthand the consequences of unchecked rage fueled by drugs and paranoia. But it was also an awakening to a sense of purpose a call to action we never expected but fully embraced. So there we were, Sam Caldwell and Carl Anderson, two seasoned truckers once solely focused on driving countless miles across this great country, now also standing as crusaders battling against the demons of drug addiction and mental illness that plagued so many lives lurking behind those long stretches of lonely roads. I was hopping from one boulder to another along the nearly dry riverbed, laughing with my friends, Ernesto and Jlio. It had been a while since we just goofed around like this, and I couldn't remember the last time I laughed so hard. Hey, Guillermo, watch out for snakes! Ernesto called out jokingly. Panting to catch my breath, I took a moment to let them know my parents were from the Corrientes tribe in Peru. 
We'd relocated when I was eight years old to Maraca Ecological Station in Brazil, where my father worked with the locals to conserve the Amazonian ecosystem. Just then, Jlio shouted, Guys! You have to see this! And held up what appeared to be a strange doll made of twigs and grass. We exchanged puzzled looks but shrugged it off as a weird find. Over the next few days, we noticed other strange items in the forest near our village. Large claw marks on trees and mutilated animal carcasses. Although frightening, we assumed these gruesome findings could be attributed to jaguars or wild predators. One day, we stumbled upon an unsettling discovery. A circle of ash surrounding a blood-stained altar with remnants of burned candles. This went beyond anything we'd seen before. It was as if someone had performed a ritual. Maybe it's just kids playing pranks, Ernesto suggested half-heartedly. We collectively decided not to mention this to anyone, fearing panic among the villagers. Things escalated when one of our friends went missing. Her name was Jolinda. She didn't show up for her teaching job at the school. Despite our skepticism, whispers about strange occurrences spread around the village, including tales of the Pishtaco, a creature from Andean folklore said to prey on human beings. Fears surged through our community as paranoia settled like fog. Determined to find Julinda, we searched the forest with the help of a few trusted friends. After hours of combing the woods, we stumbled upon a horrific sight, Julinda's mutilated body near a riverbank. Ernesto vomited at the sight, and Jlio's face lost all color. What could do this? Jlio stammered tears streaming down his face. The grisly scene looked eerily similar to the ritualistic spot we had seen days earlier. As we reported our awful discovery to the authorities, terror concealed our once carefree village as if a curse had taken hold. Days later, our lives were forever changed as two more villagers went missing. Even skeptics began questioning their beliefs in the explanations hitherto held for such events by others. Something monstrous haunted this forest, and rational thought became overshadowed by dread and superstition. When an outsider arrived at the village asking for directions to the Maraca Ecological Station, unaware of the panic-stricken atmosphere, I reluctantly offered guidance, feeling it was my duty as one of the locals. As we walked through the forest, he introduced himself as Dr. Ricardo Vasquez, a cryptozoologist from Quito, Ecuador. He was investigating stories of strange creatures that preyed on humans in this region. Dr. Vasquez asked me about recent events when we heard an ear-piercing scream in the distance, pulling me back into a dark reality. We rushed towards the sound only to find Jlio being attacked by a horrifying, grotesque figure with wild eyes that penetrated my soul and skin so pale that veins were visible like entangled roots beneath it, the Pishtaco. We fought off the Pishtaco long enough for Jlio to escape its clutches, his body trembling in fear as he struggled to breathe. Dr. Vasquez quickly pulled a small pouch from his backpack, filled with what looked like ashes and threw it towards the creature. As the ash made contact with its skin, the Pishtaco screeched in agony and retreated into the depths of the forest. We stood there, our hearts racing, grappling with the reality of what had just occurred. Dr. Vasquez explained that he had been researching this elusive creature for years after hearing about similar occurrences in neighboring regions. He believed that only certain elements could repel it. The ashes he carried were made of a rare plant found in Ecuador, believed to have protective properties against evil spirits. United by this terrifying experience, we knew we had to act fast to save our home and potentially other villages in the region from this evil force. With Dr. Vasquez's knowledge and guidance, we began strategizing ways to confront and defeat the Pishtaco. 
gathering items believed to offer protection and ward off negative energy, such as amulets, charms, and plants, became necessary for every villager in our increasingly paranoid community. Our once simple daily lives are now focused on survival against an invisible threat lurking among us. Meanwhile, coordination with local authorities led to an organized search party tasked with tracking down information on any other disappearances or sightings of this terrifying monster. As we continued our research and prepared for confrontation, an ominous atmosphere hung heavily over every individual in the village forever altering our perception of the safe haven Maraca Ecological Station once represented for us all. Whatever lay ahead of us would test not only our physical strength but also our unity as a community facing an unimaginable nightmare together. I remember the day my life changed forever as if it were yesterday. My name is Torin Ragsdale, and here's something you should know about me. I thrive on adventure. I was pretty well off selling outdoor gear, and I'd gotten into amateur filmmaking a year ago. When my best friend Zach Hawks suggested we explore an abandoned town in the Nevada desert, I couldn't resist. Let me tell you something about Zach. He's always been the wild one in our group. He was kind of like my brother. We grew up together and got into all kinds of trouble. Anyway, this place we were going to check out was called Drywater. We didn't know much about it except that it had been isolated and supposedly deserted for decades. We set off with our filming gear in a jeep overflowing with adventurous spirits, snacks, and several cans of beer. After hours of driving through desolate terrain, we finally reached dry water. It was a forgotten settlement with a handful of decaying buildings that were barely standing. We spent most of the first day exploring and filming some B-roll footage for our YouTube channel. As night fell, we camped out just outside of the town limits, shared stories around the bonfire, and drank a few beers. We crashed in our tent soon after, tired but still on an adrenaline high. That first night started typically enough, another crazy adventure with my best friend. But our lives took an unexpected turn when we woke to the sound of panic screaming coming from the town. Startled, we grabbed whatever improvised weapons we could, Zack had a sizable wrench while I wielded my trusty pocket knife and headed toward the noise. We followed the screams to a half-collapsed building with boarded-up windows. Without thinking twice, Zack kicked down the door while I followed closely behind, camera rolling. Inside, lying on the dusty floor, was an older woman, her hands trembling and tears streaming down her face. Scattered around her were several other people, all equally terrified. What the hell is going on? Zack demanded, producing a feeble yelp from the woman. Who did this to you? Turn back. It was the chupacabra, whispered one of them, a middle-aged man who looked gravely injured. In any other circumstance, we might have laughed off their mention of an urban legend. But the fear engraved on their faces was too profound to be fiction. We decided to help them, hastily bandaging their wounds and dragging them back to our jeep. As we sped away from dry water, I asked the woman what had happened. It just started attacking us last night, she said between sobs. Nina, she didn't make it. None of them could explain why they were in dry water or where the creature had come from, but they mentioned that they'd been cornered for days hopelessly praying for salvation. And from out of nowhere, it seemed that we were it. Days later at the hospital, we faced our greatest shock yet when a doctor pulled us aside and explained that he had found traces of an unknown substance in the injured survivors. It wasn't anything he'd encountered before, and he urged us to report the incident to the authorities. 
As we left the hospital, Zack and I knew that we couldn't let this go. We were determined to uncover the truth about dry water and the mysterious chupacabra. Over the next few weeks, we delved into research and spoke with locals from nearby towns who had their own stories about encounters with strange creatures lurking in the deserts. What had started as a fun adventure quickly turned into a full-blown mission to expose a hidden danger lurking at the heart of Nevada's forgotten corners. Filled with curiosity and determination, Zack and I returned to dry water equipped with more sophisticated gear, hoping to document our findings and reveal the disturbing truth behind the encounters. What we uncovered during those harrowing days in the desert not only changed our lives but also brought to light the existence of something unknown that many others had dismissed as mere legends or myths. The footage we captured became a crucial piece of evidence for both local authorities and paranormal investigators. It also transformed our ambitions as amateur filmmakers into something much bigger a journey that would lead us down a new path of uncovering unexplained phenomena across America. In hindsight, it was because of that fateful trip to dry water that Zack and I found our true purpose. It solidified our bond over a shared passion for unraveling otherworldly mysteries that would eventually put us on the map in the world of paranormal investigations. A journey that began with friendship, adrenaline-fueled adventures, and an eerie legend found in a ghost town now continues as Zack and I travel together through unknown terrain, searching for answers amid shadows where few dare tread. So, there I was, sitting in a small town diner in Benson, North Dakota. Just me. Rosemary Landon, a 30-something, recently single freelance writer who had just moved from New York City to escape the noise. As I sipped on my lukewarm coffee and bit into my bagel, an elderly local named Walter Jennings struck up a conversation with me. Walter told me about his life as a farmer and about the changes in this town over the years. Eventually, he leaned in and shared some lesser-known information about the area, something about a creature that had been rumored to lurk in the woods near Benson. Apparently, people had gone into those woods and never returned. At first, I laughed it off. Small towns have stories like these all the time. It was probably nothing more than folklore to entertain naive newcomers like me. But then I met Tessa Dalton, a headstrong young woman who had her own encounter with whatever that thing was. You don't believe me? Tessa scoffed after she revealed her experience. Look, she said, pointing to the long scar on her arm. This is what I got after stumbling upon that damn thing. For some reason, everything within me told me she was telling the truth. But as curious as I am by nature, I made a decision that would change my life. Together with Tessa and her skeptical brother Jackson Dalton, we decided to venture into those very woods to face the creature head-on and prove its existence, or put an end to the rumors altogether. It started off as a relatively innocuous hike. The sun was shining through the trees, and birds were singing their songs, nothing remotely horrific or dangerous at all. As we walked deeper into the dense forest that surrounded Benson, Jackson joked around while smoking cigarettes while trying to calm our nerves with his humor. It wasn't until we found the fresh carcass of a deer, torn to pieces, that things started to get a little tense. Guess we at least know it's carnivorous. Tessa muttered, and her brother's face turned serious. From that moment on, we became increasingly quiet and cautious as we continued our journey. In the distance, we began to hear the sound of something massive moving through the trees. Twigs snapped under heavy footsteps, and the rustling of leaves grew louder and closer. Our hearts raced in anticipation. And then it struck. An enormous creature lunged out from the shadows, 
growling ferociously as its razor-sharp claws swiped through the air. Its eyes were mesmerizing pools of blackness, and its hide was covered in coarse fur like no animal I've ever seen before, in person or in a picture. We all took off running without hesitation. The creature pursued us relentlessly through the forest, causing absolute havoc as it tore through everything in its path. We barely avoided its lethal attacks more than once that night. When it finally lost interest or maybe just thought we'd escaped too far away, we stumbled out of the woods dirty, terrified, and panting heavily. A profound sense of shock and relief washed over us as we realized that we had survived what could have been our certain demise. Upon returning to Benson, Walter admitted knowing about other encounters with the creature but had never shared full details out of fear people wouldn't believe him, or worse, they would go searching for it like us. After extensive research, we discovered that this beast matched descriptions of a notorious Wendigo, a ghastly creature from Native American mythology known to stalk its prey and possess supernatural power. As for proof, the haunting experience forever etched as a scar on our memories will have to do for now because none of us are brave enough to venture back into those woods to face that monstrous thing again anytime soon. As word spread throughout the town, locals began to come forward with their own chilling encounters and stories about the Wendigo. A sense of fear and unease settled over Benson as people exchanged whispers and wary glances at every corner. Together, Tessa, Jackson, and I decided to document these testimonies and collect any evidence we could in the hope of raising awareness about the creature lurking in the woods around our town. We poured through old newspaper clippings and visited neighboring towns to dig deeper into the truths surrounding this legendary beast. Our quest for knowledge took us to numerous reservations where we spoke with elders who were all too familiar with the Wendigo's tales of terror. As we pieced together fragments of information and folklore, we realized that our mission to expose the Wendigo had evolved into something much larger than ourselves. It had become a fight to warn others and potentially save lives. From those fateful days on, our lives were forever changed and we were united in our commitment to investigate further into the mysteries surrounding this creature, all while rekindling a sense of community in a once close-knit town now shrouded in darkness and fear. You wouldn't believe what happened to me a couple of years ago. It was around midnight and I was driving through Kansas along Route 14, close to the small town of Ellsworth. I was on my way home from visiting my sister when I suddenly realized that my gas tank was almost empty and that the next stretch of highway didn't have any gas stations for miles. As luck would have it, I found this old, rundown gas station right off the road, with one functioning pump available. The station seemed like the kind that hadn't been used in years. No cars in sight. No attendants around. My name is Jackson Morrow, by the way. I'm a 35-year-old math teacher living near Topeka. So anyway, I was filling up my tank when this rusty pickup truck pulled in behind me. At first glance, there was nothing unusual about these four guys who got out of the truck. They looked like your average blue-collar worker returning from a long day on the job. As they started chattering away and lighting up their cigarettes, a man named Dale approached me, asking for directions to the nearest motel. He said they had been driving all day and needed a place to crash for the night. I told them there was one about ten miles down the road. Dale thanked me and was about to walk away when his friend Vince called him over talking about some guy named Harold who took his money at a poker game earlier that night. They all started laughing while discussing ways to get back at Harold for cheating them out of their hard-earned cash. That's when things started to take an unexpected turn. 
Before I knew it, Dale returned with Vince and this bulky guy named Mitch. They were whispering amongst themselves before Vince mentioned something about disposing of Harold as payback for what he did during the game. My heart raced as I tried to keep my cool, but I guess they noticed me eavesdropping because Mitch shot me a menacing glare. Panicking, I quickly finished refueling and got into my car. I was hoping to make a quick getaway when Dale stopped me, asking if everything was all right. I remember trying to hide my nervousness as I told him everything was fine. Dale kept eyeing me up and down, seemingly debating whether or not to let me leave without any further trouble. Finally, he relented with a sinister grin and said, Better be careful out there. You never know who you might run into. With my pulse pounding in my ears and my hands trembling on the wheel, I sped off from the gas station. A few days later, the local news reported that the mutilated body of Harold was found in a roadside ditch by the Ellsworth County Sheriff's Department. Dale and his crew were nowhere to be found. It sent shivers down my spine because it made me realize that I had narrowly escaped what could have been a horrifying encounter myself. To this day, whenever I pass by that old gas station along Route 14, now abandoned and overgrown, I can't help but feel a sense of dread wash over me as I recall that fateful night, knowing the murderers were never caught and Jackson Morrow might still be on their list. Months have passed since that chilling encounter, but it still haunts me every time I close my eyes. The horrifying truth that I might have been another victim of Dale and his group of nefarious friends had I not been so quick to leave keeps me up at night. I've since moved from the area and, as an added precaution, quit my teaching job in Topeka. My life has taken a different turn since then. A newfound need for self-protection and vigilance led me to pursue private investigative work. Through my investigations, I've discovered that there's a string of unsolved murders along Route 14, dating as far back as 15 years ago. Each case is eerily similar. Mutilated bodies found discarded in ditches or under bridges with no suspect in sight. I'm convinced that Dale and his friends are responsible for these heinous crimes. I've reached out to the local police multiple times but they'd brushed off my concerns, assuring me that the authorities are doing everything they can while implying I'm exaggerating the danger to myself. So now I find it my personal mission to bring these monsters to justice. Justice for Harold and the countless other victims whose lives were cruelly snuffed out by these depraved individuals. As each day passes, my determination grows stronger. I'm meticulously piecing together clues, hoping to uncover their whereabouts before they claim more victims or come after me. It's become an obsession of sorts, an obsession triggered by that one fateful encounter at the forsaken gas station alongside Lonely Route 14. Will my efforts finally lead to their downfall, or am I destined to become a failure, haunted forever by the shadows cast by that spine-chilling night? Only time will tell. It was a typical Friday night for me and my close group of friends. We had all just finished our work week and decided to head down to Marco's Bar, our favorite dive bar in a quiet neighborhood on the outskirts of Roanoke, Virginia. I should probably introduce myself. My name is Dylan Thompson. I'm a 26-year-old electrician who's lived here all my life. Our usual crew consisted of my childhood friend Macy Anders, her boyfriend Leo Santiago, and the witty twins Nick and Nora Collins. We were all laughing, sharing stories from our week, shooting some pool, and enjoying a few too many drinks. Never had we imagined what awaited us later that night would be straight out of a true crime horror story. 
As the night progressed and we were all feeling pretty buzzed, someone came up with the idea to visit the abandoned church in the woods that lay about an hour from town. It was the twins. It had to have been them. They thrive on unconventional adventures. Each one of us had heard rumors about this secluded place being used for mysterious purposes, but no one ever paid any attention. We gathered our things, piled them into Leo's old pickup truck, and headed for the woods. With each turn down smaller and darker roads, we grew more curious about what secrets this hidden church held. Upon reaching the woods edge around 2 a.m., Maisie opened her phone to guide us through the dense forest. It took some time navigating over fallen branches and between tree trunks until we finally stumbled upon it, a crumbling stone structure barely recognizable as a once proud church. As we approached cautiously but confidently, trying to prove ourselves fearless against whatever cultish deeds awaited, we couldn't shake off a creeping paranoia lingering in our minds. The thick wooden entrance groaned under our hands as we pushed it open slowly, revealing an eerie yet fascinating interior covered in cobwebs and half-melted candles scattered on the floor. Spooky, Nick quit, doing his best to lighten the mood. There was a loud rattle from deep within the rafters, and we stumbled back. The sudden sound of footsteps broke our initial panic. A man with a twisted smile emerged from behind the altar. He called himself Shepherd Phillips, preaching to us about the Church of Divine Revelation, a secret, powerful sect that gathered here in secret. Phillips explained how their miracles were granted by dark forces that demanded blood sacrifices in their name. Despite all our skepticism, he boasted of their invincibility and deity-driven status which kept them safe from persecution. As we stood there, taking in every bit of information, flabbergasted by how well-organized and fanatical this cult sounded, we heard faint cries echoing through the corridors. Even with slight intoxication playing tricks on our senses, we knew those were not fake. It didn't take long for us to locate a room filled with drugged captives in prison for the cult's ritual purposes. Phillips had let his confidence in his sinister beliefs lead him into unintentionally revealing their darkest crimes. We came up with a pretend story that seemed logical and made it appear as if we were genuinely interested in joining them. As Leo whispered a fake anecdote about how his uncle had shared cultish stories with him as a child, they started to buy into our plan. As we played along, gaining their trust bit by bit, our minds raced to find a way out and devise a plan to save the captives. It was then that we realized that Nick and Nora had gone quiet since the time we found the prisoners. They had sneaked away and using their keen wit, started to untie the captives without being noticed by the cult members. Meanwhile, Macy pretended to faint at the prospect of joining the sect, giving her an excuse to send me out with her to get some fresh air. With two of us outside, Nick and Nora working silently within, and Leo holding down the fort with his engaging storytelling skills and lies, our audacious rescue attempt was in full swing. The first few captives were untied now, blending in with Nick and Nora as they took positions near the door. The moment was tense. A single misstep could jeopardize not just our plan but also our lives. As Leo's story finally reached its climax and everyone was engrossed in his fake dedication toward joining the cult, Nick gave a subtle nod. It was time. We sprang into action, pushing open the doors from outside while Nick, Nora, and the newly freed captives rushed out past Phillips and his bewildered followers. There wasn't any time for second guessing. We all booked it toward the forest entrance with adrenaline fueling our exhausted bodies. As we raced back to Leo's truck hidden amongst thick overgrowth, we could hear furious shouting from behind as the cult members attempted pursuit. But luckily for us, connections made in school with Star Trek runners came in handy as Leo's pickup roared back to life and off into the night. 
dirt spraying wildly as tires dug deep into soft mud far away from that unholy place. I couldn't believe it. After years of living in Minton, Oregon, I never thought I'd find myself standing at the edge of a crime scene. My name is Jeremiah Branson, and this is my terrifying story. Living in a small town has its ups and downs. Everyone knows each other, and it's safe to say we're all pretty close. Working as an electrician, I often got called to fix stuff at people's houses. It was during one of these jobs that everything went south. It was the Miller's Place, an old couple who lived on the outskirts of town. I arrived at their house to fix some fuses when I ran into my buddy, Rick Allen. It turns out he was there to take care of some plumbing issues. We got our work done and decided to grab some drinks after. As night fell, we headed down to our usual spot, the Thirsty Fox, to catch up with Tori Marshall, a local barmaid and our good friend. We laughed and gossiped about shared acquaintances when, suddenly, a disheveled man stumbled into the dimly lit pub. His eyes were wide with terror. I need help, he gasped. There's something in the woods. Rick laughed it off as a drunkard's rambling, while I couldn't help but feel a genuine sense of fear in his voice. Against Rick's advice, we decided to help the man retrace his steps. We trekked into the woods cautiously, flashlight beams cutting through the darkness. After nearly half an hour of searching, we found ourselves face to face with sheer horror, several mutilated animals scattered across a clearing in various stages of dismemberment. The man mumbled something about, Melissa Cheeto an ancient Choctaw myth involving a soul-stealing creature known for torturing its victims before killing them brutally. While Rick and Tori tried to reason that it must be a wild animal, I could sense an impending threat. As suspense built, we were startled by branches snapping close by. The terrified man took off running, leaving us dumbfounded. Despite our skepticism, we agreed that it was time to leave the woods. A dark figure appeared behind a tree ahead, and my heart raced. It seemed too large to be human, but the cloak of darkness hid any discernible features. We cautiously returned to town and reported our encounter to Sheriff Turner. Dismissing the event as a black bear sighting, he sent us on our way. We reluctantly left the station and headed home. Days later, we found out about the gruesome murder of Alice Miller's three cats. Despite warning Sheriff Turner about the strange events in the woods, he continued to dismiss any supernatural influence. Determined to uncover the truth behind Melissa Cheeto, I began investigating local archives and folklore books. This led me to a man named Joseph Whitehorse from the nearby Choctaw Reservation. He shared chilling accounts of a father who murdered his entire family while under Nelissa Chito's control. Spectres were said to possess their victims during moments of darkness in their souls. As more odd occurrences piled up around town, we raced against time to discover this sinister creature's true origins and stop it from causing more harm. Even if it meant sacrificing our very own lives. In the following days, our small group of friends, Rick, Tori, and I immersed ourselves in the study of local legends and mythology. With Joseph Whitehorse's guidance, we sought to uncover any possible way to counteract Melissa Cheeto's sinister influence. Along our journey, we became more and more convinced that this malevolent being was responsible for the terrifying events unfolding in Minton. Word spread through town about our investigation, and it wasn't long before others shared their own eerie encounters with something lurking in the shadows. Sleepless nights plagued us as we dug deeper into the darkness that veiled our once peaceful town. Desperate for a solution, 
we traveled to ancient burial grounds at the heart of the Chacto Reservation. Joseph shared a ritual that he believed could help ward off evil spirits and protect us from the Lusichito's grasp. As dusk approached, we gathered around a fire pit, reciting ancient chants while anointing ourselves with sacred oils. The atmosphere was tense, and we felt a weight lifting as though some dark presence was watching us from afar. Armed with an arsenal of knowledge, courage, and supernatural protection, we returned to Minton determined to confront and banish this dark entity from our lives and town once and for all. We patrolled the woods at night accompanied by knowledgeable elders from the community, their wisdom granting us strength in our quest. As weeks turned into months, fewer inexplicable incidents occurred in Minton. Our collective efforts appeared to be making a difference against the malicious creature. However, we never lost sight of our mission, knowing that Nalusa Cheeto could still be lurking close by or even within someone, waiting for its next moment of weakness. Our bond as friends grew stronger than ever as we took on roles as protectors of our town, determined to expel this unrelenting darkness no matter what it took. Ultimately, our terrifying brush with the unknown forever changed our lives and the small town of Minton. With each passing day, we remained vigilant, knowing that the fight against Nalusa Cheeto was not over but merely dormant. For we knew that only through unity, perseverance, and trust in each other could we keep this evil at bay, safeguarding what once seemed lost to darkness and bringing it back into the light. You wouldn't believe this, but I stumbled upon something genuinely terrifying a couple of months ago. It all started when my buddy Harris and I decided to explore deeper into the Amazonian forest. We were in Brazil, precisely near the Marayan River region, working on a research project about the medicinal properties of plants in the area. By the way, my name is Heron Teixeira. I'm an Amazonian native with a background in ethnobotany. Anyway, back to that horrifying encounter. The first day went pretty normal. We gathered samples, documented our observations, and shared some laughs while setting up camp for the night. During dinner, I joked about a time when Harris mistook poison ivy for a salad leaf back in college. As dusk turned to night, we heard rustling sounds in the bushes. It's not unusual in a dense forest like this, so we didn't think much of it. We continued laughing and exchanging stories until we noticed something odd. Our surroundings were suddenly quieter than before. Yeah, that's strange, murmured Harris as he picked up his torchlight and cautiously scanned the area. We dismissed it as an anomaly and continued our research for the next few days without any issues. On the fourth day, things took a dark turn. While heading back to base in the late afternoon, something bizarre caught our attention just off the path. Footprints from some strange creature mixed with blood trails on the muddy ground. Harris tried to rationalize it as wild boar tracks or perhaps a jaguar attack on some poor monkey. But deep down, something felt off. It's getting late, Heron. Let's report this back at camp, suggested Harris, trying to maintain his skepticism while keeping me away from panicking. We tried to get some sleep that night, tossing and turning with anxiety consuming our thoughts. The next day we decided to call for help and figured out that Lazaro, a local who resided nearby, could provide some insight. Harris got in touch with him, and soon enough, Lazaro came to our campsite. We led him to where we found the tracks, and he observed them with grave concern. He mumbled something under his breath before turning to us. You both need to leave. Now! You're dealing with Kurupura. He warned us, his voice trembling with fear. Kurupara is a legendary creature in Amazonian folklore that disguises itself as an animal 
or tree and is believed to punish those who harm nature. It's said that you can never outrun it, as its backward-facing feet will always lead you astray. Of course, Harris couldn't accept this explanation, but another terrifying event changed his mind later that night. We were huddled in our tent when a high-pitched scream pierced the air. We rushed outside to see Lazaro's lifeless body, mangled beyond recognition. Horrified and panicking now, we packed our stuff and did our best to navigate through the forest, knowing full well that Kurupura would try everything to delay our escape. Every rustle of leaves or snapping branch felt like a sinister taunt from this invisible terror. Finally, after two days of excruciating fear and continuous mental torment, we stumbled upon civilization, a remote village named Santa Clara de Achenia. The locals took us in and tended to our wounds as we tried our best to recount the horrific experience we had gone through. Days later, we found out from the villagers more chilling details about Kurupura. They'd been connected with a series of gruesome deaths in the region over the years. According to them, poachers are often targeted for their actions against wildlife. Despite being grateful for our survival, I couldn't help but feel immense sadness at Lazaro's fate. Hearing his name now and then in the village had a lasting impact on us. As for Harris, he remains skeptical but asserts that something evil still resides deep within the Amazonian forest. Upon returning to the city, Harris and I tried to resume our normal lives. The memory of our unnerving experience in the Amazon, however, never left us. We made a pact to continue raising awareness about the dark side of poaching and the importance of preserving wildlife. Harris became more open to the idea that there might be forces in nature beyond our understanding, while I found solace in immersing myself in my work on medicinal plants. Our friendship grew stronger than ever before as we began working together on various environmental projects, driven by our shared goal of protecting the fragile ecosystem we once called home. And every so often, when day turns to night and darkness envelopes the surroundings, we still can't shake off that lingering fear. Kurupura could be watching, waiting for its next victim in the heart of the lush, mysterious Amazonian forest. So there I was, on a hot summer evening, filling up my car at the Desert Oasis gas station right off Route 66 in Amber, California. My name is Gregor Foster Smith. I'm just your average accountant who recently moved out to California for a new job opportunity. My buddies and I had decided to take a road trip to celebrate my new beginning. Things were normal as we all joked around while waiting for our gas tanks to fill up. Benny quickly went in to grab some snacks, leaving me and Andy outside sharing a smoke. Man, this place sure is isolated, Andy remarked casually as he exhaled a puff of smoke. We carried on our conversation, and after what seemed like forever, Benny finally returned with several bags of chips and drinks. Just as we finished fueling up and I tossed my cigarette on the ground, I noticed a guy walking towards us from the shadowy desert landscape. As he got closer, Andy also noticed him. Hey, do you need any help? Andy called out to him. The guy approached us with an unsettling grin on his face. Nah, he replied with a distinct southern drawl. Just checking out this old gas station y'all have here. He introduced himself as Lester Thurman and told us about the locals and their peculiar habits. For some reason, he knew quite a bit about our characters, what type of people we were, making us feel strangely uncomfortable while still managing to be eerily fascinating. As the conversation progressed, it became apparent that Lester's knowledge was unnerving. 
It seemed as if he knew everything about not only us but also everyone else who'd ever stepped foot inside the Desert Oasis gas station. While at first Lester acted friendly towards us, it soon became evident that there was something sinister lurking behind his seemingly innocent demeanor. He spoke about violence and killings in such detail that it sent a shiver down my spine. I noticed Andy and Benny were also feeling uneasy. Things escalated when Lester pulled out a knife and nonchalantly started cleaning his nails with it. Our hearts raced as the tension in the air thickened. Then Lester regaled us with stories about several brutal crimes that had taken place in this very area over the last decade. None of us moved, frozen in fear as he went on describing these gruesome acts, his eyes locked onto ours. When Lester finally finished his chilling tales, he glanced at his watch and said that he'd better get going. Days after we'd escaped this terrifying encounter, I discovered from an old local news article that Lester Thurman was actually a wanted fugitive suspected of multiple counts of murder across four states. It appears we may have narrowly escaped becoming his next victims. That night, as we pulled back onto Route 66 with our hearts still pounding in our chests, we couldn't help but keep glancing over our shoulders for any signs of Lester. As the miles between us and the Desert Oasis gas station grew, so did our disbelief at what had just occurred. We spoke very little on the remainder of the trip, each of us lost in our own thoughts, and replaying the haunting encounter with Lester Thurman over and over in our minds. When we finally arrived at our destination in California, exhausted and shaken, we agreed that it would be best to report our encounter with Lester to the authorities. Fearful that he might still be in the area, we cautiously provided descriptions of him and recounted the details of our conversation as best as we could recall. The police took the matter seriously and promised to do everything in their power to locate Lester before he could harm anyone else. The following months were filled with a tense mixture of fear, paranoia, and some relief knowing that our story had at least brought the fugitive's existence to light. Whenever we'd get together as a group, Lester's name would invariably come up in conversation, making it impossible for any of us to ever truly leave that dark night behind. And every once in a while, as I pass an old gas station or take a drive down a deserted highway, I can't help but think back to that hot summer evening on Route 66 when we encountered the enigmatic and chilling character that was Lester Thurman a figure that continues to haunt us even now as we attempt to move forward with our lives. It all started at the local gas station on Foster Road outside of Cedarville, Tennessee. I was headed home after a long day at work and I desperately needed to refuel both my truck and myself. As a construction site supervisor, the days can really take their toll on a guy like me. The name's Rory Clarkson, by the way, and do excuse my digression. I'm just not used to recounting past events like this. So, there I was, lazily sipping my soda while leaning against my truck, when I overheard two men talking by the coffee machine inside. Both appeared to be around my age, mid-thirties, with one having a scruffy beard and disheveled hair while the other had blonde hair that looked greasy enough to match his outfit. Yeah, man, I heard about this weird gathering in the woods behind the old Layton's barn up by Wixon Creek, said the scruffy guy to his friend. Weird? Like, what kind of weird? Questioned the blonde guy with genuine curiosity. Something about people dressed in dark robes and chanting some crazy shit, replied Scruffy. Somehow this conversation piqued my interest, as it was something rare and unique that would likely never come up again. In retrospect, perhaps it would have been better not to insert myself into their talk, but for some reason I really can't explain, 
I decided to ask these strangers for more information. Hey guys, sorry to interrupt. I started. I couldn't help but overhear. Are you guys talking about something happening near Wixon Creek? The two strangers studied me for a few seconds before Scruffy shrugged and nodded. Yeah, why? You know something about it? I shook my head regretfully. Nope, but it sounds interesting. What's going down exactly? And does it have a name or something? Scruffy seemed to have a knack for storytelling, as he began to give me more details about what they believed was some sort of cult gathering. Apparently, a friend of theirs had stumbled upon the group while hiking in the area and claimed to have seen people in dark robes performing strange rituals and shouting bizarre chants. Yeah, and our buddy Mark, he's a total skeptic, but he swears he saw someone getting hurt for real, like blood and all, said blonde guy, just as matter-of-factly as Scruffy. Jesus, I muttered, disbelief tinged on my face. We debated the possibility of it being some kind of prank, but the conviction in their voices led me to think otherwise. I offered to accompany them as they checked out the gathering for themselves, curious about experiencing something so peculiar for myself. The men agreed, and we agreed to meet up after work near the old Layton's barn at Wixon Creek. As dusk turned into night, we parked our vehicles and began walking toward the location provided by their friend. We tried not to draw attention since we were essentially trespassing on private property. Just as we arrived at our destination, we could hear faint chanting filtering through the darkness. It almost felt like an eerie whisper that made goosebumps crawl over our skin. We hid behind some bushes and cautiously peered through the foliage to see a circle of figures dressed in dark robes, like Scruffy and Blonde Guy had mentioned. There must have been about twenty of them standing around what appeared to be a makeshift altar or platform. The air surrounding us grew colder, and an indescribable aura of tension hung heavy, much like the feeling one gets before a thunderstorm. The chanting grew louder as we stayed hidden watching the scene unfold before us. It was difficult for us to understand the words they were chanting, but their harsh and guttural sounds resonated deep within our bones. Several robed figures stepped forward with torches, illuminating the area just enough for us to see a struggling individual tied to a post in the center of their circle. Our hearts pounded in unison as a dawning realization came crashing down on us. This wasn't just some prank. It was real, far too real. As terror gripped our very souls, we hesitated, unsure of what action to take. The chanting reached its climax, and one of the hooded figures produced a knife from their robe. Seeing this weapon forced us into action, our shared instincts for justice outweighing our fear. We hastily broke cover from our hiding place and rushed toward the scene, intending to do whatever it took to stop what was happening before it was too late. I was leaning against the hood of my car, taking a drag from my cigarette as I checked my watch. Damn, I hated being stuck in the middle of nowhere while I waited for my cousin to arrive. It was sometime around midnight, and we agreed to meet at this gas station just outside of Yuma, Arizona. As the minutes slowly ticked by, I started reminiscing about our childhood adventures. My name is Caspin Sanford, and I grew up in a small town with my cousin, Quincy Devines. We were inseparable, getting into trouble together and scaring each other with local urban legends. But life happened, and we drifted apart. So when Quincy called out of the blue and asked if I wanted to go on a road trip like old times, how could I say no? Little did I know that our journey would turn into my own personal nightmare. Hey! Sorry I'm late, Quincy shouted as he pulled his car up next to mine. As he cranked down his window, he added, 
You won't believe what happened back there. What's up? I asked casually. Well, there was an altercation in the last town we passed through. Apparently someone got assaulted downtown. Quincy said grimly. Damn, that's messed up, I replied, lighting another cigarette. As we filled our tanks and stocked up on some road trip essentials inside the gas station store, I couldn't help but notice an old man sitting alone. He seemed distressed or maybe just plain weird. At that point, though, it didn't seem important. But that changed when we eventually headed off into the night. As the miles rolled by, we talked about those old legends and creepy crawlies until Quincy suddenly stopped in his tracks, recalling an odd incident earlier in the day. Yeah, now that you mention it, he hesitated awkwardly. I saw that same guy from the gas station in the last town too, and he was hanging around my car. Hearing this made my chest tighten, but I tried to brush it off. After all, we were two grown men with years of experience, right? But still, the atmosphere became a bit uncomfortable. Throughout our journey, we kept noticing strange occurrences that were impossible to ignore, unsettling artwork on the fences lining the highway, whispers that slowly crawled under our skin when we stopped for breaks in desolate locations, and the constant weird feeling that we were being watched or followed. The situation finally reached its boiling point when, one night at our motel, I woke up to see the same old figure from the gas station standing outside my window, staring straight at me with a sinister grin. In his hand was something metallic, and sharp. I screamed out for Quincy, who quickly came into the room and was horrified by what he saw. We hightailed it out of there faster than I ever thought possible. As we sped through the night, frantically discussing what happened, a news bulletin came on, presenting new information about the assault Quincy mentioned earlier. He's identified as Ambrose Kitteridge, said the newscaster. Kitteridge is wanted for a string of violent crimes across several states. That name sent shivers down our spines. We had unwittingly crossed paths with a psychopath. Days after our lucky escape, a local cop filled us in about Kitteridge and his bizarre obsession with travelers. Apparently, he would lurk in small towns along popular road trip routes, stalking vulnerable victims before striking. Our encounter with him had been too close for comfort, and we knew we couldn't just go back to our regular lives without doing something about it. We decided to join forces with local law enforcement, sharing everything we knew about Kitteridge's whereabouts and appearance. As the days turned into weeks, the manhunt for Ambrose Kitteridge intensified. Quincy and I found ourselves working closely with the police, exchanging theories, and piecing together any bits of information that could help bring him to justice. Despite the terrifying ordeal we had been through, our childhood bond only grew stronger. One fateful evening, while going through some files at the police station, I came across a sketch of a familiar tattoo spotted on Kitteridge during an earlier crime. It was the same design we had seen on one of those unsettling artworks along the highway during our road trip. This crucial piece of evidence led us directly to an abandoned house deep in the Arizona desert where Kitteridge had been hiding out. With cautious optimism, dozens of officers closed in on his dilapidated hideout. After a tense standoff, Ambrose Kitteridge was finally caught and brought down by police snipers. As news of his capture spread across the country, Quincy and I were hailed as heroes for our role in helping to apprehend such a dangerous criminal. The scars of our harrowing encounter would take time to heal, but Quincy and I had rediscovered a friendship that would be treasured for years to come. And although our road trip had taken an unexpected and nightmarish turn, it ultimately led us down a path of renewed brotherhood and purpose that neither of us could have ever predicted.
It was me and my best friend Raimundo that day, messing around in the Amazonian village we called home, an isolated tribe deep in the heart of the Amazon rainforest known as Quilambala. As young men often do, we wanted to prove who was stronger or who could run faster. This time, it was about who could swim the length of the nearby river the fastest. I caught a Silva Mendez, have lived my whole life in Quilambala. A life filled with hunting, learning from my elders, and fiercely protecting our home from deforestation. Raimundo came from a neighboring tribe and settled here only a couple of years ago. Although we often bickered at first, we'd grown inseparable after several shared adventures. Wanna bet I can smoke you? Raimundo shouted across the river, grinning as he tied his long locks into a bun. Not a chance. I snorted as I took my position on the embankment. As we stood there poised and ready to dive in, an old fisherman approached us with a mischievous glint in his eye. You boys aren't scared? He asked, smirking when we shook our heads. With that, he strolled away without another word. Laughing at his odd comment, we set off into the water, racing towards the other side. This fisherman's strange question didn't bother me during our furious race, but those words would haunt me later that night. The sun had set by the time I left Raimundo's hut and began my walk back towards mine. The evening air was still warm and full of the loud calls and songs of many jungle creatures. Suddenly aware of how dark it had become, I quickened my pace. Something far louder than any animal I'd ever heard echoed through the forest. Branches snapping aggressively, frantic grunts barely audible over the sound of rushed breathing. My skin crawled in fear but my curiosity got the better of me as I cautiously moved towards the noise. In a small clearing, I stumbled upon a scene that will be forever burned into my memory. A colossal creature straight from one of our tribal legends was ripping apart one of our tribal warriors. The Mapinguari is an enormous, mythological creature with vicious teeth and a smell of death emanating from its gigantic body. Its eyes reflected the terror I felt infiltrating my soul. The vivid yet silent screams of the brave warrior it held in its grasp echoed all around me. In those moments, I made the split-second decision to run for my life, knowing full well that if I were caught or heard, a similar fate awaited me. With silent, panicked breaths, I slipped back into the jungle towards my tribe to warn them of this monstrous entity that had invaded our world. As I finally stumbled back into our village, gasping for air and trembling violently in fear, Raimundo found me near his porch. Mano, what happened? You look like you've seen a ghost. It's out there, I whispered desperately, my voice strained and barely audible. A mapping worry! With caution in his stance but skepticism on his face, Raimundo listened attentively to my recounting of events. The reality sank and when more villagers began discovering horrific scenes much like the one I'd witnessed earlier that night, various warriors remained left behind by this mythical monster. Raimundo and I joined others as we devised a plan to seek out this beast and put an end to the bloodshed it had rained upon our people. It's strange, Raimundo muttered to me one night after all this horror had passed, about how an old fisherman had mysteriously vanished shortly after all these dreadful events took place. You know, he continued, I always thought there was something off about that guy casually stalking around and asking us if we were scared right before the Mapinguari began its rampage. I nodded in agreement, recalling the fisherman's menacing grin and the unease that his presence brought. We wondered if the fisherman was somehow connected to the mythical creature or if he had simply known of its imminent arrival. The sudden disappearance of both the man and the monster left us with a lingering sense of dread and unanswered questions. Over the next few months, 
Our tribe worked relentlessly to rebuild our village and restore a sense of safety. Raimundo and I formed a close-knit group of skilled hunters and warriors, training together to ensure we were prepared for any future threats. Stories of the Mapinguari from that fateful night became legend, passed down through generations as a reminder of our ancestors' bravery and resilience. The Amazonian rainforest remained a tranquil dwelling for our villages for countless years, with only distant murmurs of Mapinguari sightings at the far reaches of neighboring tribes. Raimundo and I, once bound by competitive rivalry, now find ourselves united by the call to defend our people, a bond forged in blood and courage. As for the mysterious fisherman, he never returned to Quilambula or any nearby settlements. His connection to the sinister truth remained a mystery, only whispered about during moonlit nights huddled around crackling fires. In time, even his memory began to fade into obscurity like a dark tale told on stormy nights, an omen warning us not to forget what lies in wait within the shadows of our beloved rainforest. It was an average day at the office, the kind where you stroll in for your nine-to-five grind without a care in the world. My name is Jackson McAllister, and I work as a freelance graphic designer based in Bridgewater, South Dakota. My childhood was unremarkable, but lately, my adult life has been anything but ordinary. During lunch break, my buddy Martin, Marty, Adams and I were discussing our weekend plans. Marty had recently moved into this old, run-down farmhouse about ten miles out of town. It had been quite a fixer-upper, but Marty always enjoyed that kind of work. So you're still up for helping me finish the kitchen renovations tomorrow? He asked as he took a sip of his black coffee. You bet, I replied. I could use some hands-on work after staring at screens all day. Fast forward to Saturday. The morning flew by as we worked on the kitchen, painting walls and installing new countertops. By early afternoon, we were exhausted and decided to take a break. That's when we heard it, a faint howl in the distance. It was coming from the woods behind Marty's property. Probably just some coyotes or something, I said dismissively. Marty chuckled and said, Well, if it gets any closer, we'll just have to scare it off. As we continued working on the house throughout the afternoon, every once in a while, we'd hear that strange howl again, each time sounding closer than before. The sun began to set as we finished the last touches in the kitchen. After pouring ourselves some celebratory beers and sitting on the porch to enjoy them, we noticed something odd just beyond the tree line, a pair of glowing eyes staring back at us. Marty grabbed a flashlight and shone it toward the creature. It had dark fur and appeared canine-like, but it was much larger than any dog or coyote. Frightened, we retreated back inside and locked all the doors and windows. We called local wildlife authorities to report the sighting, but they seemed skeptical. As night fell, we could still see those glowing eyes watching us through the windows. The howling continued, now accompanied by scratching noises at the door. Desperate for help, Marty recalled something he'd heard from his neighbor, an old legend about a creature known as the Michigan Dogman. Supposedly, it roamed the area terrorizing residents and even killing some. It sounded far-fetched, but in the moment, there weren't many other rational explanations. For hours, we huddled together in the house, trying our best to ignore what was happening outside. At one point during our ordeal, Marty spoke to his neighbor on the phone, who went on to explain that perhaps the renovations had awakened something that had been slumbering for years like something out of an ancient curse. Around dawn, everything seemed to grow eerily silent.
terrified but needing to know if it was finally over, we peeked out through a crack in the shutters. The creature was gone, vanished without a trace. Early that morning, when we were leaving the farmhouse, bags packed and desperate for sleep, a group of men from town approached us with questions. They had heard rumors about our encounter and were hunting for whatever it was that had tormented us throughout the night. His name is the Dogman, one older man insisted. He appeared stone-faced and serious. Every few decades he rears his ugly head around these parts. Marty sold his house shortly after that harrowing experience. We never learned if there was any truth to this so-called Dogman legend. But one thing is for sure, our lives would never be the same after that terrifying night in Bridgewater, South Dakota. Years have passed since that fateful night, and Marty and I have gone our separate ways. However, the memory of those glowing eyes remains etched in our minds. Sometimes, we get together at the local bar and still talk about that terrifying encounter. Each time, the urgency of the incident fades a little, replaced with a small sense of pride that we survived that night, whatever it was. The people of Bridgewater now speak in hushed tones about the dogman legend. Parents use it to scare their children into behaving, and teenagers dare to venture into the woods on nights when they feel brave. As for me, I've been keeping my ears open for any other sightings or stories about this eerie creature from locals and people passing through town. Surprisingly, similar tales keep cropping up from time to time, not just in South Dakota but throughout the entire region. So far, nobody has managed to capture the elusive dogman on film or provide tangible proof of his existence. Some days, I wonder if it's all just an elaborate hoax or a collective delusion shared among Americans living in rural communities. But on other occasions, usually at night when I'm alone and vulnerable, looking out my window into the darkness, I can't help but believe that something sinister still lurks out there waiting to be discovered. And perhaps the quiet little town of Bridgewater holds more secrets than anyone is willing to admit. I still remember that day like it was yesterday. My best friend Calvin and his sister, Kara, had come up with the brilliant idea of a weekend getaway to the mountains. You see, we had all been working our asses off and desperately needed a break. I'm Robbie Ross, by the way, a 28-year-old programmer from Oklahoma City, and at that time, I couldn't have asked for anything better than chilling in a cabin for a couple of days, leaving all worries behind. So, we hit the road up to Snoqualmie National Forest in Washington State. The four-hour drive was filled with laughter and nostalgia as we took turns reminiscing about our childhood antics. It was like we hadn't aged a day since our college years. On arriving at our destination, a charming, secluded cabin nestled within the woods, we got settled in and popped open a few beers as dusk approached. Surrounded by thick foliage and miles away from the nearest town, it felt like we were the only people left on earth. The evening had passed nicely until we noticed an odd flickering light in the distance on our first night outside, roasting marshmallows by the fire pit. Calvin jokingly suggested it was probably some drunk guys partying deep in the woods, but he shrugged it off eventually. The next morning, while walking Duke, Calvin's chocolate lab, we stumbled upon something bone-chilling. A mutilated animal carcass was cleanly laid out on some flat stones arranged in a circular pattern. Blood stained the forest floor around it, making for an eerie sight. Of course, Duke nearly yanked my arm off trying to investigate this gruesome scene more closely. That afternoon, while we were exploring nearby trails, we kept finding these strange symbols etched into trees a combination of lines interwoven with circles and triangles, 
similar to what you'd imagine ancient runes might look like. This only served to heighten our unease. As night fell, we decided to huddle up in the cabin and drown our worries with the help of some much-needed booze. We had planned to spend one more night there, but decided that with everything that was happening, it was best to leave first thing in the morning. But then we heard a guttural chant. Stupidly, curiosity got the better of us, and we followed the sound, creeping through the darkened woods. That's when we saw them. A group of at least five robed figures surrounding a large bonfire. They chanted wildly as they seemed to perform some ritualistic dance around it. We'd clearly stumbled upon a cult performing a secret ceremony in the seclusion of the forest. Realizing that we were way over our heads, we turned to leave but accidentally snapped a branch beneath our feet. The chanting stopped abruptly, and their heads spun in our direction. Those few moments felt like an eternity until Calvin took the initiative and picked up a big rock, hurling it towards them. The distraction gave us enough time to run like hell back to the cabin. Gasping for air, we bolted the door and packed everything up in a panicked frenzy. We hustled into the car with Duke and sped through the pitch-black forest to get as far away from there as possible. As we tore through the winding roads, our hearts pounding in our chests, we couldn't help but feel like we were being pursued by some unseen force lurking just beyond our sight. The branches of the surrounding trees scraped against the car like desperate fingers, as if trying to drag us back to the madness we had narrowly escaped. Each passing moment felt like an hour, and every turn along the dark forest pathway only heightened our terror. Eventually, dawn broke and the first rays of sunlight began to pierce through the misty shroud blanketing the forest floor. With each passing mile, relief washed over us. We had somehow managed to leave that nightmarish episode behind. Once back in the safety of civilization, we reported our harrowing encounter to local authorities, who seemed skeptical at best. Despite our vivid descriptions of the grisly animal remains and eerie symbols scattered throughout the woods, they offered little more than vague reassurances and advice to avoid venturing into secluded areas late at night. Disappointed but not entirely surprised by their response, we decided it was best to move on and put the events of that fateful weekend behind us. Although it's been years since that chilling experience in Snoqualmie National Forest, during which time our lives have continued down their respective paths, I still can't help but feel a chill whenever I think back on those bizarre occurrences. While it may remain one of life's many mysteries, one thing is for certain, our once carefree group has learned that there are depths in this world far beyond what most would consider normal, or even rational. That short weekend getaway changed us forever, serving as a stark reminder that beneath its veneer of tranquility and beauty, nature may be hiding something far more sinister. It was an unusually quiet night at the I-10 gas station on the outskirts of Phoenix, Arizona. I usually spend my weekends hanging out with friends, but work had been hectic, so I was heading home for some much-needed rest. My name is Ellis Carmody, a 31-year-old software developer who moved to Phoenix three years ago for a new job opportunity. As I pulled my car up to the pump and began filling up the tank, I couldn't help but notice the sharp contrast in customer traffic from my usual daytime pit stops. Strangely enough, there was only one other person at the station, an older guy standing behind a blue pickup truck a few pumps down from mine. He seemed preoccupied with his phone, so I paid him no mind. Arizona nights do have their charm. I thought to myself as I basked under the lone streetlight casting a warm glow over the lot. The attendant inside and I exchanged silent nods as soon as our eyes met through the glass. 
After paying for my gas inside using cash, I received change from the attendant named Rafi, a guy in his early twenties who sported a sort of scruffy beard. He was definitely skeptical about my choice of payment and joked about how nobody uses cash anymore. We both laughed it off before diving into some small talk, just two strangers bonding over TV shows and work drama. I heard the entrance buzzer go off as another customer walked in, so I said my goodbyes to Rafi and returned to my car. That's when I saw him, a man wearing dark clothes exiting a beat-up sedan parked across the lot. As he walked towards me and passed under the flickering overhead lights, my mind immediately registered that something was off about this guy. Perhaps it was his strange gait, or maybe it was just paranoia setting in, but whatever it was, it had me on edge. He stopped in front of the elderly man, who was still absorbed in his phone, and sharply asked, You got a cigarette? The old man looked up with a confused expression, taking a few seconds to respond. I don't smoke, sorry. Instead of walking away like I expected, Mr. Dark Clothes glared at him with palpable rage. My heart raced as I watched the stranger suddenly lunge towards the old man, viciously yanking his wallet from his back pocket before hurling him to the ground. It took me a moment to process what was happening before I shouted, Hey, stop that! The man snapped his head in my direction, giving me a chilling glare that suggested he didn't take kindly to interference. He began sprinting toward me with the stolen wallet clenched tightly in his fist. Panic thoughts raced through my mind as he closed the distance between us. I managed to jump in my car and slam the door shut behind me just as he reached it. Those few seconds before locking the door felt like hours. Suddenly, he slammed his fist against my window, snarling through gritted teeth. The rage in his eyes seemed fueled by more than just a stolen wallet as he circled my car like an animal hunting its prey. I couldn't shake this sinking feeling that there was no way out. When sirens blared from a distance, I saw his muscles tense for a split second before he darted across the parking lot and disappeared into darkness. Finally remembering to breathe, I started my engine and peeled out into the night, leaving behind a flood of relief that festered into lingering fear. Days later, over coffee with Rafi, he told me about an ex-con named Cyrus Langford who had recently been released on parole. Rafi explained that Cyrus had a notorious reputation in the area, known for his short fuse and history of violent outbursts. According to local gossip, Cyrus had been hanging around the outskirts of town ever since his release, and some folks suspected he was up to no good. The description I gave Rafi matched Cyrus perfectly, making us both wonder if it was Cyrus who tried to rob the old man at the gas station that night. Though the police hadn't been able to locate him, I couldn't help but feel gripped by an underlying fear and unease. I wondered if this encounter would have lasting consequences or if it was just a brush with danger that would fade from memory over time. In the weeks following my brush with potential disaster, I became more vigilant, always keeping an eye out for anything suspicious, especially during late night excursions. Nevertheless, life went on, and work demanded most of my attention slowly pushing that fateful night towards the edge of memory. And despite our brief bond formed under trying circumstances that night at the gas station, Rafi and I remained friendly acquaintances, occasionally exchanging pleasantries and sharing updates about the ongoing search for Cyrus Langford. Then one day, several months after my nerve-wracking encounter, Phoenix PD finally captured Cyrus after a string of similar incidents at other gas stations on the outskirts of town. Even though this should have alleviated my fear, learning more about his violent past left me feeling even more unnerved than before. Grateful that fortune had been on my side that night, 
I couldn't shake thoughts of what could have transpired had things played out differently. But as time went on and life continued its relentless march forward, those thoughts became less frequent, a dull whisper instead of a deafening scream. So life continued for Ellis Carmody, a software developer by day and owner of a harrowing tale from one dark night on the fringes of Phoenix. It's incredible to think that one pivotal moment can have such a lasting impact on a person's life. But in the end, it's those moments that help define our character and contribute to the stories we tell about ourselves. So there I was, just minding my own business, filling up my car at this gas station in the middle of nowhere, somewhere along Route 50 in Nevada. It was one of those places where it felt like civilization had decided to build its last outpost and hoped someone would notice. My name is Cole Masterson, and I used to work as a private investigator in Las Vegas. I decided to quit the hustle and take a road trip for some peace of mind. Little did I know what was waiting for me. As I grabbed a drink inside the station, I saw a group of guys huddled in the corner, laughing and joking around. They seemed like your everyday bunch of dudes on a road trip, except for one guy sitting silently by himself. With black hair and piercing eyes, he stared at nothing in particular but exuded an odd sense of unease. Before I knew it, we all got to talking, mostly about football and our favorite teams. Some minutes later, one guy from the group went outside for a smoke when we heard an anguished scream. We ran out instinctively, only to find him on the ground with his throat slit wide open and blood gushing everywhere. Panic set in as we struggled to process what had just happened. Who could have done something so brutal, and why? We huddled together as our conversations took on an entirely different tone. Theories emerged about who could have done it. It must have been that creepy truck driver. Maybe it's a bunch of crazy rednecks with too much time and too many weapons. We decided to call 911. But strangely enough, there was no signal on our phones. That silent guy from earlier had somehow vanished without a trace as well. Our paranoia has only increased. As night descended upon the isolated gas station, weird things started happening, like lights flickering or muted footsteps sometimes echoing across the barren landscape. It became clear that we were trapped there at the mercy of the ruthless killer stalking us. One by one, people from the group began dying in increasingly violent ways, with no sign of who was behind these gruesome attacks. Each time, though, we swore we'd catch a fleeting glimpse of the silent guy with piercing eyes from earlier. In the process of trying to escape this hellhole and save ourselves, my old college buddy Trevor confirmed that he recognized the killer. Apparently, he went to high school with him but never paid much attention because he was just another face in the crowd. It turns out that his name was Xavier Delaney, and he was always a bit creepy and odd. As I barricaded myself in an office in the gas station after narrowly dodging an attack from Xavier, I found some newspaper clippings, stories about horrific murders happening on this very stretch of road. Almost paralyzing fear gripped me as reality hit. We had unknowingly entered a serial killer's hunting ground. And then there was silence. No laughter or joyous banter, just a cold, eerie silence punctuated by the muffled sobs of those still alive. We were at Savior's mercy, now fully aware that not all our fates would have a happy end. But who would be next? As the hours dragged on, the few survivors left, Trevor, Jessica, and I, huddled in a tight circle, our eyes scanning the darkness that enveloped the gas station. Our hearts raced with every creak and whisper of the wind, leaving us wondering if it was our turn to be claimed by Xavier's thirst for blood. 
we had to devise a plan. Though our minds raced and our limbs trembled in fear, we knew that doing nothing was as good as submitting ourselves to him. The night seemed impossibly long and silent, save for the occasional sob or gasp from one of us. We decided to make weapons out of anything we could find, a rusty wrench, a tire iron, even an old hunting knife discovered buried in a drawer. Though crude and makeshift, they were still our last defense against Xavier's unrelenting brutality. As the sun finally began to rise after what felt like an unbearable length of time, we took cautious steps outside, every shadow casting doubt upon our newly found courage. As we approached Trevor's car with bated breath, ready to escape this terrifying ordeal, Xavier lunged out of nowhere, his cold eyes fixated on his prey. Our fight-or-flight instincts kicked in, we leaped into action and fought alongside each other against this psychotic murderer who desired nothing but our deaths. In the initial confrontation, Jessica managed to wrestle Xavier's knife away from him and stab him viciously near his left thigh. With blood now painting both sides, our determination overpowered our terror. This ends here. We will not be his victims any longer. Our final battle ensued. A frenzy of fists meeting flesh and blood-curdling screams echoing through the dawn. In what seemed like an eternity packed into minutes, we were victorious. Xavier dropped to the ground motionless, his fading expression of rage frozen in time. Exhausted yet alive, we drove away from that accursed gas station, looking back one last time at the nightmare we had just survived. With every mile that passed, we felt lighter and stronger. We were survivors. The road ahead stretched out towards the horizon, obscured by the rising sun but signaling a new page filled with uncertainties, new opportunities, and most importantly, hope for a brighter future, free from Xavier's relentless grip. I still remember the day I crossed paths with the Chilichaki, an encounter that forever changed my life. It started when I joined a research expedition to explore a remote part of the Amazon rainforest called Alto Perz National Park in Peru. I was excited, but little did I know that this seemingly innocent journey would transform into a horrifying ordeal. My name is Renzo Quispe, and until recently, I worked as a park ranger in various protected areas throughout South America. Having grown up in the region, I have always been comfortable exploring the wilderness. My parents taught me valuable survival skills and how to respect the delicate balance of the natural world. Our group consisted of experienced locals, including my childhood friend Javier Maldonado and a few renowned international researchers. Altogether, we were seven individuals making our way through this vast forest teeming with life. The first couple of days went smoothly as we navigated our path, studying unique flora and fauna along the way. It was on the fourth day that things took an unexpected turn. As we ventured deeper into the forest, Javier and I were walking on a narrow trail, with me leading, when we came across strange footprints. These weren't like those left by any animals we'd seen before. Two human-like footprints, but one much smaller than the other. Intrigued, we decided to follow them but didn't share this discovery with the rest of the group. We didn't want to alarm anyone or cause undue panic since it was probably just another research team in the area. Besides, everyone had their tasks collecting plant samples or setting up camera traps for wildlife sightings. As we trailed along these bizarre prints, we couldn't help but feel increasingly uneasy about our surroundings. We started hearing strange noises echoing through the trees, not your typical forest sounds but rather distant growls and whispers as if someone or something was always nearby but out of sight. 
Javier pulled me aside, keeping his voice low. Renzo, do you have any idea what the hell we're dealing with here? He looked genuinely scared. I'm not sure, I replied, trying to find a logical answer. It could be a hunter and his dog, or some sort of primate. Let's cover more ground, and if it gets too weird we'll head back. We pressed on for a while but discovered no clues to explain the footprints. As the sun began to set, we reluctantly decided that it was time to return to camp. Our nerves were rattled, but given our shared skepticism regarding local myths or supernatural beings, we chalked up our anxiety to being in an unfamiliar environment. The next morning, one of our crewmates, Lisbeth, went missing. A search party was assembled quickly, and though everyone worried that she had become lost or maybe even injured, there was still no mention of any danger involving those odd footprints we encountered the previous day. As dusk enveloped us and search efforts proved fruitless, it became apparent that something odd was indeed going on, a situation far from normal. More importantly, well-kept fears within the local community about ghosts and malevolent creatures fueled speculation about the mysterious Chilichaki. When we finally trekked back to civilization three days later after seeing other strange phenomena and sending a formal report requesting assistance in locating Lisbeth, no one mentioned the Chilichaki as a plausible cause. It wasn't until several weeks later during my idle conversation with a shaman in a local village while seeking some closure that I first heard about this creature, an elusive shapeshifter from Amazonian folklore with one large and one small foot that tricks, terrorizes, or kidnaps its unsuspecting victims. Though I wanted to dismiss this legend as mere superstition or myth formulated by indigenous communities to explain inexplicable events, the descriptions and stories provided by the shaman mirrored our terrifying experience with eerie accuracy. It seemed almost impossible to deny that the Chulachaki were somehow involved. And now, as I recount this harrowing tale to you, I still can't shake the feeling that something otherworldly accompanied us during that fateful expedition, a presence far beyond my understanding. The Chulachaki remains an enigmatic figure, yet a constant reminder of how little we truly comprehend about the mystical world lurking within the depths of the Amazon rainforest. Months have passed since that unforgettable expedition, yet the haunting memories and unanswered questions still linger in my mind. In an attempt to find closure and perhaps a deeper understanding of the Chulachaki, I have delved into indigenous folklore and consulted numerous shamans, spiritual leaders, and local experts throughout the Amazon region. While each story or account differs slightly from one another, they all share a common thread, a warning to tread carefully in these sacred and ancient forests, as there are forces beyond our comprehension that dwell within. Many locals regard the Chulachaki as a guardian of the rainforest one who protects its secrets and maintains its delicate balance from those who might seek to exploit it for their own gain. It seems curious to me that such a benevolent force would resort to instilling fear or causing harm, but perhaps there is a larger lesson at play here, one that challenges us to reconsider our relationship with nature and acknowledge the deeper mysteries it harbors. Over time, I have found some solace in embracing this newfound appreciation for the complexity and wonder of the natural world. Even though we never found Lisbeth, her disappearance has taught me that we must always be mindful of the unforeseen consequences of venturing into uncharted territory. I have come to accept that there are phenomena for which we may never find satisfactory explanations and experiences that defy our conventional understanding of reality. As I continue my work as a park ranger and embark on future journeys into the Amazon's vast wilderness, I carry with me not only caution and respect for these enigmatic forces but also a humble sense of awe, 
a profound reverence for what remains hidden within the verdant heart of an ecosystem that continues to captivate and mystify us all. Is there truly a shape-shifting spirit known as Chilichaki concealed beneath the dense Amazonian canopy? Could this elusive being hold answers to ancient riddles or offer insights into long-forgotten truths? Perhaps these darker corners of the world are best left unexplored or at least approached with the respect, curiosity, and humility such mysteries evoke. Regardless of how much I learn or uncover, I will never forget the terror that still grips me when I recall that fateful day, the day we crossed paths with the Chilichaki, an encounter that will forever haunt my dreams and haunt the depths of the Amazon rainforest. My name's Adrian Montero, and let me tell you, there's some SH asterisk T in this world you can't even imagine. I work at a small bar in Augusta, Georgia. It's a cozy place that attracts folks of all kinds, and some prefer to keep to themselves. I was never one to pry into other people's affairs, but this one night changed everything. I had just finished my shift and decided to stick around for a few drinks with my friend Paul. See, Paul is a curious guy, always exploring and pushing boundaries. He suggested we go on an adventure that night, somewhere far from the city lights. At the time, it seemed harmless enough. What could possibly go wrong? We packed our bags and decided to take his beat-up pickup truck through a less-traveled dirt road off the usual highways. It led us deep into the woods, where we came across a clearing perfect for setting up camp. We cracked open beers and enjoyed the tranquility of nature. A couple of hours passed when we suddenly heard the distinct sound of chanting. Paul smirked at me, his curiosity piqued by the mysterious noise. We locked eyes and didn't think twice. Something was going on out here. Quietly, we crept through the forest until we could make out the flicker of torchlights up ahead mixed with shadowy figures. The closer we got, the more we understood that this was no ordinary gathering. These individuals were dressed in black hooded robes. The chants grew louder as they formed a circle around an altar in the center of their gathering. As if things couldn't get worse, they placed an unconscious woman on top of it. I felt sick to my stomach just imagining what could come next. Without hesitation, I called 911 and whispered as best I could what was happening without alarming anyone nearby. Paul grabbed my arm and urged me to get out of there. But it was too late. The robed figures had seen us. Frantically, we ran through the forest as fast as our legs could carry us. We knew they were chasing us because of their guttural threats echoing through the trees. Paul tripped over a branch and let out a cry of pain. I quickly pulled him back up to his feet. When we finally made it back to the truck, we threw our bags in and floored it, wheels screeching. In the rearview mirror, I could see the furious mob of cultists chasing us out of the woods. Fifteen minutes later, as if emerging from hell itself, we found ourselves back on the main road. A pair of blue and red flickering lights greeted us in the distance, the reinforcements we had called upon earlier. We breathlessly explained everything that transpired. The cult had vanished into thin air by the time law enforcement arrived at the clearing, but they did find evidence of strange rituals gone awry, including animal remains and symbols carved into trees. Days after our ordeal, an investigative journalist named Frank Kersey tracked me down for an interview. Focused on uncovering the truth behind criminal organizations, he discovered this cult worshipped an ancient Babylonian deity believed to grant them untold power through human sacrifices. We couldn't have imagined that such a horrifying reality existed right at our doorstep. Sometimes, when I'm alone at work, I can still hear their chants in my head. And every time my body shudders, 
A reminder of that night makes me realize how close Paul and I were to being their next victims. I never thought I'd have a story to tell like this, but now that it's happened, I can't get it out of my head. My name is Clark Neville, and my friends, Sam Reardon, Tris Morley, and Mike Delaney, and I work together at a construction firm in Round Rock, Texas. On an ordinary Friday after work, we decided to hang out and unwind with a few drinks at Mike's house. We were sitting around laughing and having a good time, as we had done many times before. It was while sharing some of our most embarrassing stories that Tris mentioned that he used to blame everything on an urban legend called the Rougarou. What's a Rougarou? asked Sam, curiosity piqued. Tris smiled deviously. It's an old Louisiana myth, a creature that is part person and part animal. My grandparents used to talk about how it devoured any bad kids that wandered too far into the swamp at night. Though we found the story interesting, none of us genuinely believed it. We were just grown men enjoying some drinks after work. Later in the evening, Mike suggested that we go for a drive to clear our heads. We didn't need much convincing. As we were getting into Mike's beat-up truck, Tris jokingly said we should beware the Rougarou. Our scenic route around town led us to a remote spot known as Carla's Bend an infamous curve on the outskirts of town where accidents often occurred. The dense woods around us seemed unnaturally dark, even for a cloudy, moonless night. As the truck slowed down to round Carla's bend, headlights flashed on from behind us out of nowhere. The sudden brightness momentarily blinded Mike, causing him to lose control of the vehicle. The truck swerved off the road and slammed into a nearby tree with crushing force. Shaken but miraculously unharmed except for a few cuts and bruises, we struggled out of the wreckage, bewildered by what had just transpired. The approaching car appeared to be an old, battered station wagon. Two men got out, one tall and scruffy, the other short and plump. They seemed friendly enough, albeit somewhat on edge. Sorry about the lights. The taller of the two apologized. I'm Darren Johnson, and this is my buddy Jake Humphrey. I just wanted to make sure you guys weren't speeding. What are you doing out here anyway? Mike asked suspiciously. Jake nervously glanced around before answering. The truth is, we were trying to catch a glimpse of that rigorous thing Tris was talking about. We exchanged looks trying not to laugh at their apparent belief in folklore. Yet as we mocked them silently, a low growl echoed from deep within the woods, close enough to send chills down our spines. Panic set in as we scrambled to get back into the battered truck, only to find that it wouldn't start. We were stranded as an ungodly howl pierced through the night air. The forest came alive with movement, was shaking bushes and snapping branches fueling our terror. And that was when I spotted it for the first time, an eerie figure emerging from the dense brush with large eyes shining with malice and fur-covered limbs twitching grotesquely. There it is. I screamed in horror as my friends turned to witness the monstrosity for themselves. With a guttural snarl, the creature lunged towards us, its long claws extending menacingly from its hulking form. All coherent thought vanished as we instinctively sprinted away from the nightmare before us, our fear amplifying with each thundering step of the Rougarou on our heels. We crashed through the underbrush, tripping over roots and branches in our blind panic as the enraged howls echoed behind us. The frantic heartbeat in our throats almost deafened us to Darren's sudden cry for help. The forest floor had given way beneath him, plunging him into a hidden ravine. Jake, driven by adrenaline and loyalty, immediately leapt after him, desperately trying to save his friend's life. The rest of us hesitated for a moment, 
glancing between ourselves and the approaching monstrosity. It was Sam who finally shouted above the cacophony, We have to help them. With no time to consider other options, we all followed suit and jumped into the shadowy gulf. As we tumbled down into darkness, scraping against jagged rocks and clinging vines, it dawned on us that escaping the relentless pursuit of the Rugeru would also mean confronting whatever subterranean dangers awaited us in this hidden world. When we finally landed at the bottom of the ravine, battered but alive, we found ourselves standing in knee-deep water that flowed through an immense system of twisting tunnels. The cries of our pursuer became distant echoes above as we ventured ahead with trepidation. Whether it was hope or desperation guiding us through that murky labyrinth remains a mystery. All that mattered was finding a way out before being devoured by darkness both figurative and literal. It was during those desperate moments that it became clear that whatever bonds we'd formed in our ordinary lives were now further strengthened by our shared experience. Facing an unimaginable nightmare with nothing but our courage and camaraderie as armor against the abyss. And as we clung to each other and pressed on, the overwhelming fear and uncertainty slowly gave way to a fierce determination an unbreakable will to survive united in the most primal of human instincts. We had become more than just friends or co-workers. We had become brothers in arms, ready to face anything that dared cross our path. I was standing at the entrance of the Pakuk River in the vast Amazon rainforest, chatting with my friends Jantasar Silvastro and Loera Ebelin, both of whom had arrived just moments before. I am Donario Asai, a native Amazonian who guided tourists into the jungle during its peak season. With more than enough time on our hands, we decided to take a long overdue trip to explore the mysteries of the deep Amazon. One evening, while we were setting up camp near an abandoned village, an elderly local named Martino walked towards us. We were bewildered to see him deep inside the forest, so we struck up a conversation with him. It wasn't long before he started telling tales of his ancestors' fate, victims of Gualicho, which he described as a malicious forest spirit. At first, most of us laughed it off. We were skeptics and did not believe in such supernatural events. The only thing we agreed upon was that this abandoned village would be an interesting backdrop for our stories, which were meant purely for entertainment. The following day, after our encounter with Martino, curiosity led us deeper into the abandoned village in search of relics or signs from those ancient tribesmen. As we wandered around its remnants, we discovered strange symbols etched on various surfaces, something that none of us had ever seen before. The further we explored, the more oddities we came across, strange footprints and bizarre carcasses left behind, all with eerie precision in their mutilation. It didn't take long before our skepticism began to crumble as fear slowly seeped into our thoughts. Late that night, while sitting around our campfire exchanging theories about everything we had seen earlier, we heard an unnerving sound echoing from the dark recesses of the jungle. Emitor Almirio, nicknamed Emit, another member of our group, claimed to know what that creature was. He heard about the beast from an old folk song taught to him by his grandmother, Candida, a poet. His story recounted the tale of Gualicho, the spirit who haunted these lands, taking vengeance on those who dared disturb its domain. As the night progressed, our campsite was continuously taunted by chilling sounds and fleeting glimpses of an entity stalking us in the shadows. Unable to shake the growing terror, Skresnia Peroso, another friend from our group, got up in haste, begging us to leave this godforsaken village immediately. We all agreed that our safety was the top priority and made a unanimous decision to evacuate as quickly as possible, 
leaving behind most of our belongings. The panicked urgency of Skresnia's plea had erased any remaining doubts we dared hold on to. As we retreated hastily under a moonless sky, Jantasar stumbled upon something horrifying. Emit's lifeless body lay on our path back, disemboweled and mangled. We barely had time to mourn when Gualacho appeared before us, a grotesque amalgamation of various jungle creatures, covered in blood, with an unnerving grin plastered on its twisted visage. Demonstrating otherworldly abilities, Gualacho proceeded to attack us relentlessly. Panic raced through our veins as we scrambled aimlessly in every direction, trying hopelessly to evade its assault. Amidst the chaos and bloodshed that ensued, Jantasar sacrificed himself by provoking the beast into chasing him instead, buying us precious time to flee. Gualacho never re-emerged after its pursuit of Jantasar. In the months that followed, the events we experienced deep in the Amazon haunted us with an inescapable intensity. Nightmares plagued our sleep, forcing us to relive the gruesome ordeal over and over again. As survivors, we mourned amidst tragic demise and Jantasar's selfless sacrifice, vowing to honor their memories by warning others about the malevolent spirit that lingered in those forgotten ruins. An unspoken sense of gratitude united us, for we knew deep within our hearts that if not for Jantasar's quick thinking, none of us would have escaped with our lives. Despite our traumatizing encounters, we couldn't just hide from the world and succumb to our fears. We took it upon ourselves to spread awareness about Gualacho by recounting our chilling encounter through podcasts, interviews, and published works. The hope was that our raw and chilling testimonies would prevent scores of eager adventurers from unknowingly venturing into Gualacho's treacherous domain. We became advocates for respecting indigenous folklore and recognizing that some mysteries are better left untouched by outsiders, a lesson painfully seared into our very souls. Time may have dulled the edges of terror in our minds, but one truth remained as clear as ever. Unseen forces with unfathomable power do exist in this world, lurking under guises both beguiling and menacing, awaiting those who dare pry where they shouldn't. It was a sweltering day on August 15, 2005 at a gas station near the border of Arizona and Nevada. Just a mundane afternoon, you know? I was working my shift at my dad's gas station, like any other day. My name is Evan Stapleton, by the way, and this place has been in our family for generations. I spent most of my life here, watching people stop by to refuel their cars and grab snacks for their long road trips. Anyway, that day started just like any other, until it didn't. Around mid-afternoon, this red pickup truck pulled in. Something about it seemed off. I can't quite explain it, but there was this sinking feeling in my chest that made me uneasy about the situation. The driver got out and walked over to the pump. He was a fairly tall man with buzz brown hair and wearing a white tank top something I found a bit outdated. He filled up his tank and then came inside to pay. As he approached me at the register, tossing a few crumpled bills on the counter, our eyes met for a brief moment. That's when I noticed the deep scar that ran from his eyebrow down to his cheekbone, an intense fire smoldering in those eyes of his. So, uh, Evan, he said with a slight smirk as he read my name tag. What do you do around here besides pumping gas? Just what any kid out here does, video games, hanging out with friends. I responded nervously. After exchanging a few more words that gradually escalated in hostility, he left, and I couldn't shake off the bad feeling he gave me. Hours passed by without incident until night fell. 
Shadows stretched across the deserted gas station lot as I adjusted the lights outside. Then, seemingly out of nowhere, that red pickup appeared again, as if conjured by my thoughts. The driver got out and headed straight towards me. Cash only from now on, huh? He muttered while gripping a baseball bat in his hand. Seems like you don't trust people around here or something. My heart raced. Look, buddy, I don't know what you want or why you're back here, but please just leave. I implored. His sinister laugh echoed through the lot. That unease I felt earlier had taken full form. He swung the bat at a nearby trash can, leaving a dent and sending fear surging through my core. That's an excellent choice of words because, Evan, I want you to meet me at this location tonight. He growled shoving a piece of paper in my face. He then tossed the bat into the air and caught it with ease to emphasize his point. Feeling cornered, I agreed reluctantly, our lives intersecting in the darkest way possible. As I made my way to this seemingly random location, a secluded stretch of road surrounded by nothing but dust and barren landscape, I couldn't shake that queasy feeling twisting in my stomach. When I arrived at the location just as instructed, there he was, leaning against his truck, smirking, but he wasn't alone. Three other men exited the truck, reeking of foul intentions. Dread washed over me as they advanced, savagery dancing in their eyes. I never expected it to turn into the horrifying ordeal that unfolded before me. Even as I recount these traumatic events to you now, I still feel goosebumps rise on my skin. As the men approached me, their leader, the man from the gas station, shot me a malevolent grin, dragging his baseball bat along the ground. My mind raced, desperately seeking a way out or some chance of survival, but there was none in sight. I was outnumbered and surrounded by these human predators. Suddenly, one of them lunged at me with surprising speed causing me to flinch and lose my footing. My body hit the dusty ground hard as they circled around me like vultures around their dying prey. Enough! The leader barked suddenly. He strode forward and crouched down next to me, scowling. You'll do what we say when we say it. He growled menacingly into my ear. If you so much as raise an eyebrow at this, Evan, any part of it, well, you can only imagine what we'll do to you and your little gas station. Terrified for my life and for those I loved back at the station, I had no choice but to comply with their dark demands. For weeks, that felt like an eternity. I found myself entangled in their twisted web of crime, always looking over my shoulder and fearing every shadow, wondering when it would finally be over. In the end, though, it wasn't my will that put an end to this nightmare. It was fate itself stepping in and tearing apart this vile chain of events, turning my life right side up once again. You wouldn't believe the mess I found myself in last month. Old friends, a crazy cult, and a ritual that went too far life was pretty mundane until I decided to reconnect with Oscar, an old high school buddy of mine. My name is Marcus Salvatore, by the way, and Oscar Leibowitz and I were inseparable in school, even though we had lost touch over the years. A few days after reconnecting, Oscar invited me to visit him in Tannersville, Pennsylvania, a small town located in the Pocono Mountains. It was supposed to be a weekend of catching up and reminiscing about old times. Little did I know how our simple get-together would spiral into a freaking nightmare. I met Oscar's suspicious roommate, Ronnie, at their secluded house, definitely not my idea of an ideal living situation. The first night went smoothly as we smoked cigars by the bonfire, laughed at each other's life stories, and shared a couple of drinks. We just didn't realize that we had some unwanted company lurking nearby. 
The next day started off slow. We all had crazy hangovers and spent most of our time lounging around and watching TV. Suddenly there was a knock on the door. It was Oscar's mysterious cousin Angela. She was reluctant to invite us to some gathering happening later that night. One look into Ronnie's eyes, and I could tell he knew more than he was letting on. By evening time, we found ourselves in the middle of the woods around what appeared to be a gathering made up of various people wearing strange robes adorned with symbols I couldn't quite recognize. They all seemed surprisingly normal, just some small town folks looking for a thrill, and I couldn't have been more wrong. What began as an innocent bonfire soon took darker turns when Angela handed out tiny amulets that everyone seemed to wear eagerly around their necks. Whispers and odd glances began circulating, making me and Oscar exchange nervous looks. Ronnie looked like he was prepared for whatever was coming next. His face was stern, focused. Just as we were contemplating an exit strategy, the chanting began. The cult members circled around the bonfire, chanting some ancient language I couldn't understand. Angela stepped forward with a large knife and started slicing into her palm, allowing her blood to drip into the fire. Panic erupted in me and Oscar as we realized the depths of what was happening. Our attempts to casually slink away were interrupted when we got tackled by two burly men wearing sinister grins on their faces. It turns out they knew we wouldn't participate willingly in the ceremony they had planned that night. My heart sank as they dragged us towards the bonfire. Somehow, I managed to squirm free from my captor's grip and helped Oscar escape as well. We bolted through the woods, our legs fighting against exhaustion while avoiding branches that were eager to trip us up. As we sprinted through the trees with adrenaline coursing through our veins, I wondered how this small-town gathering had turned into an insane chase where our lives hung in the balance. We finally made it to Oscar's house, out of breath and terrified. It didn't take long for us to pack up our things and race away from there, grateful that for now we seemed to be out of danger. A week later, back home in New York City, I came across an article detailing reports of newly discovered occult rituals taking place in Tannersville. These events were apparently led by a man named Reese Caldwell, who, unbeknownst to us, entered our lives disguised as Ronnie Jameson. The horror of it all still haunts me every single day, but one thing's clear, Oscar and I escaped a nightmare that would have sucked us into hell and back if luck hadn't been on our side. It all started with a text message. My name is Nathan Charka, and I'm a freelance journalist who's always on the lookout for the next big story. I've been tackling unsolved cases, interviewing subjects with bizarre tales to tell, and writing about them for years. My work usually consists of sitting behind a computer or interviewing people over Skype. So when I received an anonymous tip about something more, Hands-on, happening in a small town called Deerfield, Wisconsin, I was intrigued. But before I get ahead of myself, let me give you some backstory. I've got two younger brothers who are always down for a little adventure, Danny, who works as an electrician, and Mark, who's studying filmmaking in college. We always joke that we're the modern-day hardy boys as we dissect true crime stories together. So, naturally, when I received this tip about a potential crime scene in Deerfield, I knew they'd be on board. We arrived in Deerfield late one Friday evening after a four-hour drive, checked into our motel room, and planned our investigation for the following day. Danny had brought along his electrical tools, and Mark had his camera gear ready to document whatever we find. The next morning, over breakfast at a local diner, three older men sitting by the window intrigued us. They began talking about strange happenings around town, 
people going missing and mutilated animals found in bizarre places. My curiosity was piqued, but I brushed it off as gossip. We set out on our mission to explore the woods around Deerfield, where the anonymous tip mentioned the incident. The forest seemed ordinary at first, birds chirping and leaves rustling in the breeze. As we walked deeper into the woods, however, things began to change. Mark noticed strange symbols etched into some trees, arcane symbols that none of U.S. could recognize. It gave us chills but fueled our determination to uncover the truth. We continued our trek until we stumbled upon a clearing that seemed unnaturally quiet. The air felt thick, almost suffocating, like something was lurking, watching our every move. Suddenly, a scream pierced the silence, making our hearts skip a beat. My brothers and I exchanged glances and raced toward the sound without hesitation. There, behind a thicket, we saw what we could only describe as a creature, a grotesque being covered in dark fur with razor-sharp claws and deep red eyes, the Wendigo. The creature had cornered a young woman named Emily, who was trembling in fear. Without thinking, Danny charged at the Wendigo with the wrench from his toolkit. The monster snarled and growled but retreated into the darkness. We quickly tended to Emily, who was shaken but unharmed. Overwhelmed by adrenaline, we decided to leave the woods as quickly as possible but vowed to return with more backup to investigate further. We had stumbled upon something unexpected and terrifying, but despite that, my brothers and I were adamant about bringing this eerie case to light. Days later, I came across an article about Native American folklore that stated that the Wendigo originated from their stories of an evil spirit that fed on human flesh. This information sent chills down my spine. Every piece of information we gathered only led to more questions than answers about Deerfield's sinister secret. But that doesn't stop us from doing what we can to shed light on these strange events. After all, there are people out there who deserve answers. The Wendigo remains a mystery today. Its origins are unknown, and its existence is now written off as nothing more than folklore by most. But for those who have witnessed it, the chilling reality of the Wendigo cannot be denied or forgotten. Months have passed since my brothers and I first encountered the creature in Deerfield and we've dedicated our free time to uncovering more about this mysterious being. Since then, we've collaborated with local authorities, historians, and even cryptozoologists to piece together a clearer picture of what might be lurking in those woods. We've discovered similar incidents in nearby towns, as well as more victims who escaped the clutches of the Wendigo. Stories that echo similar themes in ancient folklore emerge from these investigations, making it clear that Deerfield is not alone in its struggle against this ancient evil. As we continue to delve deeper into this mystery, we remain committed to unearthing the truth behind these sinister occurrences and putting an end to the fear they instill in the hearts of locals. No matter where our investigations lead us or what dark secrets we unearth, my brothers and I will never forget that fateful day in Deerfield. And while many still dismiss our experiences as mere tall tales or overactive imaginations, we know that this wicked force is out there, waiting to strike again, and we won't rest until it's exposed and defeated once and for all. It was just another lazy afternoon, and I was hanging out at my friend Felipe's place. We'd been trying to come up with something to do when he proposed the idea of venturing deeper into the Amazonian forest near our remote village. Our community had always been situated on the outskirts of this vast jungle, but we never dared venture too far in. My name is Nero Mendoza, by the way. I'm of Amazonian native descent and have lived here most of my life. 
exploring and understanding how the natural world functions. Like many of my ancestors, my fascination with nature made me want to learn its secrets. So there we were, preparing for this adventurous trip. I never thought something as horrible as what happened could take place. We gathered a few more friends, Joanna, Fausto, and Teodosio, all experienced hikers who were confident in their survival skills. As we journeyed deeper into the forest, we soon discovered a hidden cave tucked away behind some thick foliage. Curious about what lay within, we decided to explore it further. Flashlights in hand, cautiously navigating through the darkness, we found an entire network of tunnels that led deep beneath the Earth's surface. A peculiar smell filled our nostrils as we ventured further. It seemed vaguely familiar but impossible to identify. We shrugged it off as just some natural occurrence and continued exploring this mysterious underground world. Following a few hours of nerve-wracking exploration, we stumbled upon an old, rotting wooden door hidden in a corner within one of the tunnels naturally intrigued. Felipe opened it slowly while the rest of us stood ready in anticipation, and that's when everything turned sinister. Beneath that door lay what appeared to be an ancient form of sacrificial altar. The signs were now clearer. This cavern was home to something terrifying, something powerful enough to warrant offerings from its worshippers. As we continued hesitantly through the cave, we heard ghastly noises that sent shivers down our spines. Suddenly, a figure appeared behind us in the narrow passage through which we'd entered. It was tall and beast-like, covered in thick fur that reeked of death and decay. None of us could identify the creature at first, but we soon realized it matched descriptions of a legendary Amazon monster called Capra, an evil forest protector of long-forgotten lore. The stories never seemed real until now. Seeing them alive was mind-blowing. Our hearts pounding in our chests, we scrambled for cover, but the creature was relentless in its pursuit. As Teodosio tripped and fell, the beast leaped upon him and tore him apart with its sharp claws in a matter of seconds. Informed by pure instinct, we darted back towards the entrance, determined to escape with our lives. When we finally emerged from the tunnel's gaping maw, covered in dirt and blood from our desperate escape, it took us several long moments to regain our composure. We'd left one of our own down there, utterly consumed by the horror that had befallen us. It wasn't until days later that I learned from one of my elders about how Capra's name spread through generations as a sadistic protector of the forest. What would prompt it to take violent action against trespassers remains an enigma to this day. But whenever I find myself visiting our village's outskirts or gazing into the lush Amazonian wilderness, I can't shake my obsession with what might still lurk within those shadows, waiting for someone to venture too deep into its territory once more. Our traumatizing experience soon became a cautionary tale among our community a reminder of the unknown dangers hidden deep within the Amazon. Though we were relieved to be alive, the loss of Teodosio weighed heavily on our hearts. Grief and guilt became intertwined, along with a burning desire for answers about the sinister cave and the monster that dwelled within it. Determined to honor our fallen friend and uncover the truth regarding Capera, I started researching ancient legends and local folklore hoping to find clues that could help us understand the creature better. In my quest for knowledge, I came across various accounts describing similar encounters with forest spirits in different regions. While some narratives spoke of benevolent guardians safeguarding their natural domain, others recounted malevolent beings tormenting those who intruded upon their sacred space. As I delved deeper into these folkloric histories, I began to suspect that Capra might not be an isolated entity but part of a forgotten network of supernatural protectors whose purpose had long been lost to time. Armed with this newfound understanding, 
I made it my life's work to study these ancient legends and ethereal beings in greater depth. In doing so, I hoped not only to prevent further tragedies from befalling unsuspecting explorers but also to bridge the gap between modern society and the mystical world hidden within nature's embrace. The more we can learn about these entities and their intentions, the better equipped we'll be to coexist peacefully with the unseen forces that share our planet, thereby fostering an environment in which both humanity and nature can flourish in harmony. It was just another ordinary evening when I found myself at that old gas station in Yucca, Arizona. My buddy, Jared Peterson, and I had been on a cross-country road trip. It felt good to take a break after hours of driving through the seemingly endless desert landscape. My name is Eric Townsend, by the way. I grew up in upstate New York, got a job in the city after college, but always felt trapped. This road trip was my way of breaking free of routine. As we got out of the car to stretch our legs and fuel up, I noticed an odd-looking man standing near the entrance of the attached convenience store. He looked like he had been there for quite some time, just observing everyone coming and going. Jared and I walked inside to grab some snacks while waiting for the tank to fill up. We were laughing about something one of our friends had texted us earlier when we realized the same odd-looking man from outside was now lurking at the back of the store near the dumpsters. Yo Eric, is that guy staring at us? Jared asked me, glancing nervously at him. I think so, I replied squinting my eyes as if it would help me get a better read on him. Let's just get our stuff and go. As we approached the cashier, Jared continued to watch him out of the corner of his eye. Dude, now he's digging through his pockets like he's got a weapon or something. I paid for our gas and snacks quickly, with an uneasy feeling growing in my chest. As we headed towards our car outside, adrenaline started pumping as we saw him following us out. Hey Eric! They say Yucca is known for its snakes taunted the stranger as we fastened our seatbelts. My heart raced as we pulled away from the gas station. What was that guy's problem? We tried to brush off the creepy encounter and get back to chatting about the trip. However, the tension remained. The desert night blurred by as we drove on, only stopping at a seedy motel in Flagstaff. That night, we tossed and turned unable to shake our feeling of unease. Just after dawn, a metallic scraping outside jarred us awake. Shit, Eric. That looks like the truck of that freak from the gas station last night. Jared exclaimed as he pulled the curtains back. Sweat poured down my face. We realized this lunatic had been stalking us. Torn between panic and determination to confront our stalker, I dialed 911 and informed the police about the situation. An officer arrived quickly, checked the area, but found no one lurking nearby, just the abandoned truck. As he took our statement, he told us he didn't recognize it as a local vehicle, which intensified our confusion. We continued our trip but began noticing similar vehicles tailing us at various intervals. Paranoia invaded our lives. In time, it came to a head when an attack finally occurred. It happened while checking out an abandoned mining town in Utah. Out of nowhere, several assailants ambushed us. They wore bandanas obscuring their faces, but that sinister voice from Yucca Gas Station stood out. The fight was brutal and unforgiving. Jared and I had never been in a situation like this before but our adrenaline and determination to survive gave us the strength to fend them off. We managed to incapacitate one of them, yanking the bandana off his face and revealing a tattooed marking that neither of us recognized. As we fought for our lives, the leader of the group, that sinister voice from Yucca, 
slipped away into the abandoned buildings as we heard sirens approaching. Panting and covered in bruises and dirt, we knew that this was far from over. In the back of our minds, we knew that there was something bigger at play, a web of danger and mystery that started with a chance encounter at an old gas station in the Arizona desert. We decided then and there to continue our trip, fueled by a new purpose, to uncover what started it all and put an end to it so no one else would have to suffer the same fate. What had begun as a simple road trip across America became a treacherous dive into the unknown world of crime, where every mile traversed could be our last. As the wind whipped around us on those dusty roads, we were determined to find answers and put an end to this terror once and for all. You know, life has a funny way of catching up to you sometimes. My name is Ashton Renford, and I used to be somewhat of a wild child. Drinking, partying, and experimenting with drugs, the works but I eventually turned my life around and found stability working as an insurance consultant. My friends still loved throwing back some beers and reminiscing about those rowdy days. One weekend, my old friends Jared Bolton and Ryan Thompson convinced me to join them on a camping trip near Hemlock Lake in New York. We hadn't seen much of each other lately because now we had grown up jobs and responsibilities. We set up camp pretty deep into the woods, so we would have privacy for some loud laughter and heavy drinking. The first day out there, we got a nice buzz going and spent the entire evening joking around like the old days. The next day, after breakfast, we decided to explore deeper into the woods. Ryan swore he saw something odd last night while he was taking a leak far from camp. So, we followed his lead for what felt like hours until we reached a strange clearing that was eerily quiet. All of a sudden, Jared tripped over something half buried in the leaves. It looked like part of a bluish metallic egg. That was when we noticed several more metallic pieces scattered all around us. It was as if something had exploded at this location. We soon discovered claw marks etched into the trees surrounding the clearing. Whatever went down here must have been serious. Curiosity peaked, and we took photos on our phones before heading back towards camp. As daylight began to fade behind us in the forest, an unsettling feeling crept into the back of my mind, a foreboding sense that we had stirred something awake. It wasn't long before things started going haywire at our campsite. That night, we heard decidedly human-like screams piercing from the dark woods. We argued about whether to check it out or run for our lives, and skepticism was getting the better of us when we suddenly stopped hearing anything coming from that clearing. But as abruptly as the noises stopped, we felt an unnatural chill sweep over our campsite. It was as though someone, or something, was watching us closely. And without any warning, a towering creature emerged from the woods, standing as tall as the trees themselves. Several rows of jagged teeth gleamed in its gaping maw. It was an oni, a demon from Japanese folklore. Why it picked up and chose Hemlock Lake was a mystery to me. The Oni's eyes burned like fire, fixated on us through a thick haze of sulfuric smoke surrounding them. Those screams we had heard earlier must have been its victims, but we knew no more, frozen in our tracks by sheer terror. As it heaved towards our campsite with a gaze that could pierce through anyone's soul, Ryan found his composure and shouted for us to get back to the car ASAP. We bolted back through the woods, sprinting nonstop. Somehow, we managed to reach our vehicle and drive away without that monstrous creature catching up to us. A few days after returning home, I overheard a local radio station discussing an attack on campers by an unknown creature at Hemlock Lake. The authorities were unable to explain what happened, 
and they announced their intention to close off the area in response. As for my friends and me, we decided never to share our photos or talk about that night again. A primal fear lay rooted deep within all of us. What if talking about it could draw that fearsome demon back into our lives? Time moved on and we each went about our lives with that unspoken agreement in place. My days returned to normalcy, though vivid nightmares haunted me periodically. The reopening of Hemlock Lake years later didn't catch my attention. It was just another news story on a forgotten incident that would never find closure. Jarrett and Ryan had also moved on from the haunting experience though we kept our distance from nature trips for good measure. One ordinary day, scrolling down social media, I stumbled upon a news article that froze me to my core. A group of campers had mysteriously disappeared from Hemlock Lake over the weekend. The initial investigation could neither locate the missing campers nor explain their sudden disappearance. The uneasy feeling returned as if something dormant had once again awakened within me. That night, Jarrett and Ryan called me separately to share their concerns. I could tell they, too, were struggling with fear and anxiety. Determining that we couldn't ignore what had happened any longer, we decided to reconvene at an old diner we frequented in our youth to discuss our next steps. Logic dictated that we should contact the authorities and reveal everything we knew about that fateful camping trip, evidence included, despite the possibility of ridicule or disbelief. But one thing was certain, however terrifying it might be to relive that experience, more lives were at stake now than ever before. As my friends and I braced ourselves for the coming storm of questions and revelations, our only hope was that it would not be too late to help those who could still be saved from the monstrous claws of the Oni lurking within Hemlock Lake's treacherous woods. It wasn't until days after the terrifying encounter that I learned the name of the man who had nearly taken my life. Jacob Fiorentino. Before all that, I was just an ordinary guy named Mike Pearson, working as a security officer at a gas station. The night that changed everything started out like any other. Yo, grab me another beer, would you? Tanner said as we lounged on folding chairs behind the gas station. The place was quiet and deserted a 24-hour station off Route 163 in Moab, Utah. Tanner had been my co-worker for about six months. We got along fine and killed time outside whenever things were slow. Sure thing, man, I replied, chuckling at his tipsiness. I stood up and walked toward the store's entrance, where Linda worked the register. As I grabbed a kin from the coolers and approached the counter, there was a rustling sound near the storage room behind Linda. We both looked up and saw a gaunt man with disheveled hair ducked behind some shelves. Linda, did you see that guy? Who is he? I asked. No clue, she whispered nervously. I've never seen him before. We decided to let it go for now. It wasn't unusual for homeless people to sneak in occasionally for warmth or shelter and returned to our duties. A couple of hours later, Tanner went inside to use the bathroom, leaving me alone outside. That's when I saw Jacob for the first time as he emerged from behind a stack of propane tanks. His eyes were dead. His gaze sent chills down my spine. He began walking toward me slowly and deliberately. Confused but alert, I called out. Hey man, are you okay? Do you need help? Jacob said nothing and continued approaching, now speeding up his pace. At that moment, something new broke into my view. A bloodied steak knife gripped tightly in his hand. Panicked, I scrambled to my feet and shouted for Tanner to call the police. I sprinted across the parking lot with Jacob hot on my tail, 
barely able to process what was happening. Swerving through gas pumps, I risked a glance back and was horrified to see him gaining on me. As Jacob raised his knife to strike, Tanner appeared out of nowhere and slammed into him with everything he had, managing to wrestle the weapon away. It was enough time for Linda to emerge from the store on the phone with the police. Suddenly disarmed, Jacob tried, and failed, to make a run for it. The police arrived within minutes, tackling him down and cuffing him. They later revealed that he was a wanted serial killer who had been targeting gas station workers in various rural parts of Utah. Only days after that horrifying experience did I learn his full name, Jacob Fiorentino. Since then, I've never forgotten it. The sheer cruelty, the inexplicable danger we faced, it was a true nightmare that left me grateful to be alive but uncertain about what had led us down this dark twisted pathway. In the weeks following our brush with death, a cloud of unease hung over the gas station. Tanner, Linda, and I found it difficult to settle back into the mundane routine of our jobs. We couldn't shake the feeling that we were still being watched or that danger was lurking just around the corner. The local news reported on Jacob's capture and hinted at his sinister motives but there were still so many unanswered questions. What motivated Fiorentino to become a ruthless killer? How did he select his victims? And why our tiny gas station in Moab? As the case unfolded in court, more details about Jacob Fiorentino's life emerged. It turned out that he had a traumatic childhood filled with abuse and abandonment which led him down a dark path of crime and violence in his adult years. While this didn't justify his actions, it shed some light on how someone could turn into such a monster. With therapy and support from each other, we slowly learned to move forward after our close encounter with the killer. A year later, we had mostly regained our sense of normalcy when a documentary crew arrived in Moab to interview us about our experience. As we sat down to recount that fateful night and share how we had coped since then, a profound realization struck me. We could have easily become just another statistic on Jacob Fiorentino's murderous rampage, but instead, we emerged survivors, connected for life by this brush with evil. The experience taught us how fragile life is and how important it is to cherish every moment we have together because we may never know what could be lurking in the shadows, waiting for an opportunity to strike. I must have been around 19 when it happened. I was just an average college student enjoying my summer break. My name is Carter O'Connell, by the way. Two of my buddies, Leo Rodriguez and Jake Westbrook, and I decided to take a little road trip to get away from the stresses of schoolwork. We eventually found ourselves in this rural part of Louisiana, which seemed like the perfect place to just relax and have a good time. It was early in the evening when we settled into this motel off the highway. The first thing we did was go down to a local bar that Leo had heard about from some guy he met on his last trip. We figured it would make for an interesting night, and boy, were we right. The bar was crowded and loud, with a mix of locals and travelers. We grabbed some beers and started chatting up people as we tried to learn more about the area. A few townspeople seemed friendly enough, but they primarily stuck to themselves or whispered among their groups. At one point during the night, as I was making my way back from the restroom, I noticed a group of people outside behind the bar, huddled in a circle. Something about them caught my attention. They were sporting eerie tattoos that seemed out of place among the otherwise cheerful crowd. Leo, Jake and I got a gut feeling that there was something odd about them but simply dismissed it as some kind of weird club or gang. Nothing serious for us to worry about, especially after having a couple more drinks. 
As the night went on, though, things began to change subtly. Drinks disappeared when left unattended. Whispers intensified in volume and frequency. Bizarre looks were exchanged between people we hadn't seen interact earlier tonight. Feeling uneasy, we decided to call it quits at the bar and head back to our motel rooms. On our walk back, I noticed subtle signs that suggested we weren't alone. Shadows seemed to loom behind buildings, almost as if they were following us in perfect synchronicity. Paranoid whispers echoed along the dimly lit streets. We tried to brush off our growing apprehensions with idle conversation, but all three of us were noticeably on edge as we entered our motel rooms. We agreed to stay in touch for the night and lock our doors, just in case. That's when it went from bad to worse. I awoke in the middle of the night to frantic pounding on my door. It was Jake his face pale and his eyes wide with terror. He yelled that he'd seen people outside his window chanting something horrifying. They wore dark hooded robes and sported the same tattoos I had seen earlier at the bar. I told him to come inside quickly as we barricaded the door and called Leo, who confirmed similar sights outside his window. No one deemed it a smart move to dial the local authorities considering how untrustworthy some of the locals seemed at this point. The three of us felt trapped and vulnerable, unsure how to proceed without putting ourselves in further danger. During a hurried brainstorm session, Leo confessed to having come across some bizarre news articles about an underground cult operating in certain parts of rural Louisiana. With the scant information from those articles in our racing minds, we began to speculate that we had stumbled upon this underground cult's gathering spot. Realizing the danger we were potentially in, we knew that we needed a plan to get out of there as quickly and quietly as possible. Armed with makeshift weapons and our adrenaline pumping, we decided to sneak out through a window in my room that faced an empty alley. Leo took out his phone and mapped the quickest route towards the car parked at the motel lot while Jake and I kept an eye on our surroundings. Treading on eggshells, we made our way to the car without making a sound. As soon as we got in, Leo gunned the engine and sped off under the cloak of darkness, leaving behind the unnerving shadows that seemed to haunt us. Despite our fear, some parts of us felt victorious for evading an unseen threat. We had made it through unscathed. In the ensuing days, News came out about a series of arrests and missing persons in the area where our nightmarish experience unfolded. We chose never to talk about what had transpired, but deep down, each one of us felt relieved for heeding our instincts and escaping a deeply unsettling situation. That wretched encounter remains etched on our minds as a vivid reminder that sometimes small-town secrets hide in plain sight waiting for unsuspecting visitors like us to uncover them. So there I was, late one night, somewhere around the middle of November 2007, back when life was pretty ordinary for me. I was driving through Arizona on my way to California for a business trip. It all started when I decided to pull over at this random gas station off Route 66. The gas station wasn't anything unusual, but everything changed that day. Anyway, my name is Edsel Rannigan. I'm in my late 30s and a senior project manager for a tech company. Life's been good to me. I've always worked hard and enjoyed a few laughs along the way with my buddies especially during our regular poker nights. The gas station sat there like any other, lonely and illuminated by flickering neon lights in the darkness of the surrounding desert. I got out of my car and started filling up the tank when another car pulled in, a beat-up pickup truck with a slammed hood that barely contained its roaring engine. The driver stepped out, Ricky Meserve, a guy I hadn't seen since high school. He was your typical small-town troublemaker back then, 
known for getting into bar fights and running afoul of the law. We exchanged some pleasantries and small talk before he asked if he could smoke a cigarette. We stood there catching up on old times, and I could tell by his glassy eyes and slurred speech that he was pretty wasted. Suddenly, Ricky's face grew dark and serious as he leaned in closer to tell me about this girl he just picked up at some roadside diner who stopped talking halfway through their journey. She was now sitting slouched in the passenger seat. At first, it was just annoying background noise until her silence got louder and heavier until it was almost suffocating him like wet cement slowly hardening around his throat. Before long, Marvin Garwood, the local troublemaker in town, pulled up to join us as our impromptu reunion escalated from an accidental encounter to something more menacing. Marvin was fresh out of prison and had a reputation for being a real loose cannon always on the lookout for his next score. Sure enough, within minutes, he started grilling Ricky about the young woman slumped in his truck. Ricky just shrugged it off at first but soon grew visibly agitated under the increasingly aggressive questioning. As tensions mounted, he suddenly exploded with rage, yelling and accusing Marvin of eyeing up his girl. Marvin sneered and made no attempt to hide his interest as he casually leaned over Ricky's truck to take a closer look at her unconscious form. That was when I noticed the fresh bruises on Ricky's knuckles. It was evident that he had played a role in her current state. My skin began to crawl at the thought of what might have happened before their arrival at this desolate gas station. What these two and that poor girl could have gone through on that wild seemingly endless night. From that moment on, the scene unfolded like a train wreck in slow motion. It wasn't long before Ricky pulled out a blade from behind his seat, lunged at Marvin, and slashed him across the chest while screaming profanities. As his blood spilled onto the cold pavement beneath him, Marvin crumpled to the ground with hatred burning in his eyes. The young woman, barely conscious now, stumbled out of Ricky's truck as a trail of blue and red lights filled our rearview mirrors. A week later, I found out that Marvin had survived the attack, but not without severe injuries that would leave him scarred for life. Ricky was arrested and charged with attempted murder, his future now hanging in the balance of a justice system with little tolerance for violence. As for the young woman, it turned out she had been drugged by Ricky at the diner and only escaped a potentially grim fate thanks to our chance encounter. I felt a strange mix of relief and horror as my ordinary life suddenly collided with something dark and sinister, leaving me haunted by the realization that such depravity could be lurking just around the corner. The events of that night ultimately marked a turning point in my life. I could no longer claim blissful ignorance when confronted with injustice. My road to California became a road to self-discovery as I pledged to stand up against those who sought to cause harm, even when it meant facing my own discomfort and risking my personal safety. I knew I had a choice, either I could turn my back on such darkness or find my light within it ensuring the shadows would not envelop me but instead serve as a reminder of what could happen if we allowed evil to persist unchallenged. It was a decision that would shape the rest of my life and ultimately guide my actions during one of humanity's most challenging times. When our world began to unravel at the seams and only those who dared to look within themselves could hope to find hope amidst despair. It all started at the annual village celebration in Naravala, deep in the Amazon rainforest. People from our tribe had gathered to celebrate the success of our latest hunting expeditions. Joking and laughter filled the air as I, Igo Abaroa, talked with my friends during the feast. Our carefree mood soon shifted after a nearby bush rustled ominously. Being an Amazonian native, 
Life in Nerevala had always been challenging, but we were proud of our people's knowledge, strength, and ability to adapt to the harsh conditions of the forest. However, none of our experiences could have prepared us for what was to come. A small group of us ventured toward the bush cautiously. Who do you think it is? One of my friends whispered nervously. No idea, replied another as we continued to approach, ready for anything that could come our way. An injured woman staggered out from behind the bushes. She was drenched in blood and barely able to stand. She struggled to speak but managed to choke out a single word. Run! Our resolve quickly turned to terror as we tried to help her while discerning what could have caused such horror. From the shadows emerged a figure with a horrifying appearance, Atahualpa Bacarango, an infamous creature said only to exist in folklore. The ghastly being let out a frightening howl that struck terror deep in our bones before charging at us with unthinkable aggression. Unable to react fast enough, one of my friends fell victim to its brutal assault. The panic survivors and I split up in hope of escaping Bacarango's wrath. I sprinted through the dense forest, avoiding low-hanging branches and leaping over fallen logs. The creature seemed relentless in its pursuit, leaving tortured screams of pain echoing through the jungle around me. Taking refuge atop a large tree, I caught my breath and realized that my friends were losing the battle for their lives. The situation was spiraling out of control, and I was consumed with terror as I fought the urge to break down. Days later, while hiding away in a cave, I encountered one of my fellow tribe members who shared their harrowing experience. They mentioned how people from our village had tried, and failed, to eliminate Bakarango. We couldn't help but wonder what kept driving such an insidious creature from our darkest nightmares to torment us. After what seemed like an eternity, all went quiet. We asked outsiders if they'd heard about the creature or anything like it, but no one could provide the slightest insight or clue. Without time to mourn properly, we focused on rebuilding our lives and the village that once brought us joy. Months after the deadly encounter, we managed to obtain information about Atahualpa Bacarango from a passerby merchant who claimed to have heard tales from other distant tribes. It turned out that our terrorizer came from an ancient bloodline of supernatural beings, a clan known as the Nikal, cursed to roam the Amazon seeking victims to vent their perpetual fury. Hearing this shattered any last shred of hope that we could be free of this nightmare. As time went on, those who survived began gradually adapting to live mindfully within the lingering shadow of Atahualpa Bacarango's malevolent presence. As if we cursed ourselves, we remained vigilant at all times and passed on this tragic story down through generations to ensure that no one would forget about the atrocities we endured at the hands of this fearsome beast lurking within the depths of our beloved Amazonian home. The legend of Atahualpa Bacarango persisted through the ages, becoming a cautionary tale for those who dared venture into the heart of the Amazon. As centuries passed, our tribe's traditions and rituals began to incorporate ways to appease and avoid this vengeful entity. We honored the spirits of the fallen in ceremonial dances, crafted talismans that were said to ward off evil and held communal prayers for protection against Bacarango's wrath. While many had resigned themselves to a life filled with the constant threat of this supernatural predator, there were some who sought to break free from the oppressive shadow it cast over our community. They embarked on a dangerous quest for knowledge and power, traversing through uncharted regions of the Amazon in search of ancient wisdom or forgotten artifacts that might hold the key to defeating Atahualpa Bacarango once and for all. These brave individuals faced numerous perils along their perilous journey, from venomous serpents to treacherous landscapes, but their determination never wavered. And so, as time marched onward and new generations rose, 
Our tribe's indomitable spirit refused to be broken by even the most malevolent of supernatural entities. Every step taken in defiance of Bakarango's existence fueled our collective hope that one day we may finally rid ourselves of this insidious scourge and live freely in our ancestral lands without fear. With every story recounted and every warning heeded, we kept alive the memory of those we lost while striving towards a brighter future, one where our children and grandchildren could flourish unburdened by the sinister presence that haunted their forebears within the depths of the Amazon rainforest. I still remember the first time I met Braden Krause. We were both freshmen at Colorado State University. Out of all the people in our dorm building, Braden stood out as an easygoing guy who was always happy to lend a helping hand. He quickly became someone I could rely on, and we became close friends throughout our college years. My name is Colton Emery, by the way. Just like everyone else, I came to CSU hoping to find myself and explore new horizons. It was in our junior year that we stumbled upon Laro the Bear Park in Idledale, just about an hour's drive from campus. This place became our go-to de-stressing spot, where we hiked, picnicked, or just hung out with friends like Aria Lane, who was studying botany at the time. She would teach us about the different plants along the hiking trails and probably knew more bad jokes than anyone else among us. One of the quirks we shared as friends was our love for mysteries and folklore, but most of that interest remained confined to casual conversations and late-night horror movie marathons until that fateful weekend when everything changed. We had initially planned a hiking trip to Lair O the Bear Park with Aria and another friend, Zephyr Leslie. As usual on such occasions, I got into my beat-up old sedan with Brayden riding shotgun while Aria and Zephyr piled in at the back. We were all eager for a break from school life. Upon reaching our campsite by the river, Aria started sharing pieces of information about an old legend called Is Cacus apparently a vicious creature that originated from Aztec mythology. She told us how it was described as a humanoid being capable of hunting relentlessly and draining people's life energy by merely being near them. At first, no one really paid attention. We rolled our eyes at Aria's love for storytelling. However, the next morning, after a night of drinking and fun, our excitement turned to panic when we found Zephyr missing from our campsite. The four of us had stayed up late around the fire, but Zephyr was the first to crawl into his tent, claiming exhaustion. We searched the surrounding area for hours, calling his name until our throats were hoarse. When we couldn't find any trace of him, we decided to retreat to town and contact the local authorities. Sheriff Colin Cedar met with us and seemed concerned, tinged with a touch of reluctance, about getting involved in yet another disappearance linked to the park. Days went by with no news about Zephyr. My friends and I felt powerless and guilty, especially Aria, who'd brought up the Iscacus legend. However, it was during one of our group conversations that Braden mentioned finding an abandoned journal on the hiking trail as we searched for Zephyr. It belonged to a lone camper who had documented various animal attacks in the area while also mentioning a daunting feeling of fear and inevitability. A common thread among all these accounts was the mention of his cacus. The events portrayed by that journal were eerily similar to our situation. Each story led to unexplained disappearances or gruesome deaths. Despite the authorities' dismissal of the connection between those stories and Zephyr's case, a palpable fear started building inside us. This fear soon reached its peak when another camper was found lifeless and drained of color nearby. Law enforcement began to take these incidents more seriously. 
but it was our unwavering determination to uncover the truth that truly propelled the investigation forward. We combed through local histories and archives, searching for any additional information on his cacus and its connection to Lair o' the Bear Park. As our research progressed, a frightening pattern emerged, an undercurrent of fear that had gripped the area for decades, with no substantial evidence ever uncovered to explain the mysterious happenings. The four of us, united in our grief over Zephyr's disappearance and fueled by our shared love for mysteries, made a pact to seek out answers, no matter how dangerous or terrifying the path may be. It was in that moment that we became a team, bound together by something far stronger than mere friendship. We became avengers in pursuit of the truth behind his cacus and the dark secrets of Lair o' the Bear Park.